All right, everybody. I am so excited to be here with Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, Marley. Good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. This is going to be super fun. I've had so much fun at your house before and looking through all of the cool bugs and invertebrates that you have there. And I'm really looking forward to looking at some of those today, hearing from the audience about what people are interested in and um, drawing some of them and learning about how we can best uh, nature journal bugs. Do you have any like nature journal pages with bugs or any um, bug specimens that you want to show us just to give us a little uh, preview of, of some of the visual treats you have in store? Yeah, absolutely. So one of my favorite things about insects is how beautiful they are, right? Like I, I find it interesting that so much of humanity, we think that they're creepy and they're disgusting and ugly. And it's almost sad to me, right? That people don't realize like things like this. This is one of my displays, the insect colors. These are all real insect specimens from around the world. Um, and you can see this variety, not only of colors, but of shapes, sizes, um, reflectivity, right? You can get that morpho on the bottom. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about insects is just this endless, um, endless inspiration, right? Like for both for nature journaling, for exploring the world and appreciating the beauty in the world that we live in. Um, you know, things like when I, I went camping recently and, and I did, this is just a caterpillar. It literally fell on my head when I was going through some bushes. Like, I think I was getting something or, you know, walking around on the beach. This was um, in the Point Reyes area. And, um, and I have to give a shout out to Jack Laws for his uh, Wild Wonder class where we mixed colored pencils because I really wanted, this was a kayak camping trip. So I wanted to be sure to have um, an absolute minimalist kit because sometimes I can get a little crazy with my kit because I love art supplies. <laughs> um, and this was a three color primary color drawing that I did just blending wow. colors. And, you know, I had time, we were camping, we were hanging out on the beach, right? Um, and doing stuff like that. Uh, other recent pages from that trip actually also um, is this one. This is uh, different carabid beetles. As an entomologist, I could recognize that these were what are called predaceous ground beetles. They're in the family Carabidae. They're a very common group. You've, you've probably seen a lot of them. Um, and I found tons on the beach. I did like this little uh, thing of the colors as I was mixing my colors. And then I don't know, if, oh, here, let me get it right to the right spot there. I got uh, I got a little bit of defensive chemicals from one of them. It did a little bit of, uh, of spitting of, of reflexive defensive chemicals on me. And those are wow. very clean. They have a lot of a smell. So I thought, well, where am I going to wipe this? I could wipe it on my camping pants or I could just on my journal page. And that was nice. food, um, right here. So, you know, one of the things that I love about insects that applies to when I teach children and, and other people um, and applies to nature journaling is how ubiquitous they are, how available they are, right? Like, yeah. you know, we all love, I love going in fact in this journal too, or me going to the zoo, right? And doing some, you know, uh, Mark Simmons style nature journaling at the zoo in San Francisco, but I have to go to the zoo in San Francisco to do that. Or if I wanted to, you know, nature journal rhinoceroses, I'd have to go to a zoo or, or a safari like I know some yeah. of you guys have done. Um, but insects are great because once you start like noticing them and you cue into them and they become part of your like um, visual field, you start to see them so often. Like that's a very common comment I get when I go hiking or camping with friends is, how did you see that? Where, where did you notice wow. that? Because once you start to like get them in your gestalt and in your like visual field, yeah. they're everywhere. And so, you, you know, rather than sitting there and going, oh, there's none of the birds I was hoping to journal today. There's no mammals running around today. Mm -hmm. You could just really quickly find um, some cool, bugs to, to journal yeah yeah so you know that's so interesting because it's like if they're um so beautiful they're so beautiful they're everywhere and they're so available and there's so much diversity and things we can learn from them why you know like why do people not really nature journal them so much or why don't people pay attention to them more or have you know what's up with that 
Yeah, I think some of it, a lot of it is our cultural, right? Our cultural feelings about insects. And some of that is totally deserved, right? Like the deadliest animal to us is the malarial mosquito, right? right so there right. are reasons, right? And, or I've, I've, I've heard um, Justin Schmidt, who's the guy who did the pain index for Hymenoptera for stinging wasps and bees and yeah. stuff. Like we're in an arms race, right? And they have clearly won because we are very afraid of them. So there's, you know, I don't want to downplay like some of our feelings about insects, right? They, they're reasons that humans sometimes culturally have an aversion to them. But it's some of it is our attitude and like where you're raised. I think um, some of you might remember from my uh, wild wonder stuff that I talked about these amazing books from Japan that I get. I mean, these are children's books from Japan, and like. That appreciation, not just for butterflies, but for yeah. all types of insects is just, it's ingrained in their culture in a way that it isn't as much for us here um, in the United yeah. States. And I think also in Europe and, and, and other places. So I think that's part of it. But if there is a crew of people who can switch their mindset and start yeah. appreciating something, I think it's the Nature Journal crew, right? Because yeah. I think all of us have this feeling of, this world is so beautiful and I wish other humans would appreciate and love it more. And so challenging ourselves to maybe love things that we didn't find love lovable to begin with. Is yeah, definitely. I think that's a great point. And I'm noticing um, this comment here, I'm gonna put it up here from Riley, who, um, who sounds like they are really excited about insects and thinks that they're the architectural show offs of nature. Um, Stephanie, do you have any, with your experience with insects, like? Um, relating to architecture or sort of like, you know, design. I know you've done a lot. Uh, you live in um, a really high tech area. So like, um, you know, kind of comparing things in nature to like architecture or, you know, thinking about biomimicry, like what are like, you know, what can we, what are some of the cool show offs from the insect world um, that you can think of sort of related to what Riley's saying? I love this comment, Riley, because I just so I one of the classes that I have a regular job teaching is I teach actually a high school entomology class at a school that's called Design Tech High School, which is the high school that was a charter school that was uh, built on the Oracle campus here in Redwood City area. Right. And um, I've always done it as a as a in person class until the last time I just taught it was my first virtual class. And I had to quickly change gears because we had always done a lot of outdoor insect collecting and observation right for the class. And this time I thought, well, this is a, a school whose whole philosophy is based on design thinking, which is a very catchy, buzzy thing here in Silicon Valley. And I thought about all the innovations that insects have that either we've thought of on our own separately, but they had come up with, you know, years before through evolution, or things that the students, like if these students never become biologists, what are ways that their minds as engineers, as material scientists? And so, yeah, architecture was one of the ones that the student who got that assignment to look up like air conditioning in, uh, in termite mounds. Oh, is, yeah. That's an amazing, I mean, that would make, Gosh, I could picture, you know, Akshay doing a, a nature journal page with arrows and yeah. flow and all that, right? Like um, things like that, like the the recent, there's been a bunch of really cool things recently, like about the ironclad beetles. These are these super tough, I can bring one out. In fact, I've got one right here. Some of these um, death feigners and ironclads here. Let me pick one out of my tank. Here's one. Um, these sorts of beetles, this is a Tenebriana beetle. This guy's alive, but he was a death feigner beetle. Some of you have met these before they have a, a habit of pretending to be dead, but I swear he's alive. And they have one of the toughest exoskeletons in the insect world. When oh. I um, pin one of these, um, my pet ones never get pinned until they die on their own. And that's kind of hard to tell, right? If you've got a death feigning beetle, when is it not faking anymore? <laughs> Um, but they have such a hard exoskeleton that you have to use um, often a little nail and a hammer rather than a traditional insect pin. And there's a recent publication this year where they found that their um, the structure of their exoskeleton, it's like jigsaw puzzle pieces on uh -huh. a oh, wow. scale, right? So there's all of these things, like whether it be robotics, materials, chemical defenses, right? We have bioluminescent. Yeah. Um, oh, and here's your proof this guy's alive. <laughs> he's he's Coming up here, let me switch my cameras so you can see. Okay. He flipped up, let's get focused and zoom in on him. 
There he is. He's alive. Oh, now he's just going to sit still, but he flipped himself over. <laughs> oh, there, see? I saw movement. Yeah. 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 And so there, it's really cool. Some of these, um, you know, these, there's, it was a really fun thing to do as a new thing for that class that I think I will be doing every single time I teach it, whether it's um, remote or in person, because- Yeah, that's that's really cool. I, yeah. I'm gonna highlight a couple other comments here. Um, first, um, Loretta is asking about the um, information about the book. She wants to look up that the book, the Japanese yeah. book. Yeah, that is sure, we'll put them in the comments. Um, they are called, there's a whole series of them. They're called Neo Books nature earth origin and i often get these um you know you and i are in the san francisco bay area we have a uh, japantown in san francisco the bookstore there you can order them online and the great thing about these is they also have pocket guides as well that are you know little and i'll often just put one of those in my purse or my backpack so that oh. when I'm out and i want to just sketch while i'm waiting or hanging out i will do that um with one of those so yeah let's be sure we get you that link to those because there's a whole series of them they're never done in english language um okay. but you know they, they have the scientific names and they're just beautiful books great and then um another comment i'm just going to show this one from linda um i think you spoke to this a little bit earlier um stephanie but it seems like nature journaling itself is often a tool that allows people to appreciate insects or other things in nature that maybe they didn't appreciate before. So that's a great success story yeah. uh, for yeah, benefits yeah. of nature journaling. And then here's another fun one. And I was wondering if we were going to get um, to there eventually. And this is my friend Ub um, from up here in Sonoma County, uh, Ubaldo. And he has a question about insects as food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, in fact, I just did a whole class and I just I just recently finally sprung and got one of these, uh, let me pull it out of its face, one of these mealworm farms. You can, this is a, a company makes these called Living Farms and they actually have a really huge one that's like a kitchen like tower, it's a lot of money. But this one's like a smaller scale one to show kids stuff about uh -huh. how, how, you know, it works. Um, it's an, it's such an interesting area, and I know that it's an area that's exploding right now from being at different entomology conferences with people who are working on it. Um, and even if we don't eat very many insects, you know, as livestock feed, it could make a really big environmental difference. But I think one of the huge things, you know, Oob mentions um, being in Mexico, and, you know, I think a huge part of it is going to be learning what people instead of trying to like make novelty insect eating you know that's like right. insect in a lollipop at a gift shop right, at a right. it's great but you're not going to actually eat insects that way you know mm. on any regular basis um yeah. is to look at other cultures right because the truth of the matter is that even though in the united states we don't eat a lot of insects mm. there are cultures all over the world who do and, and i think that we need to both look at the, to those cultures and bring them in to the to the whole idea of marketing, right? Rather than being right. formalist about it and just taking right, exactly. what we've been doing for years and taking credit for it, right? It, yeah. It's because there's a lot of interesting recipes with insects and traditions of eating insects all over the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, it, a, that's a, a really good point. And I think, you know, I interviewed um, Paul Vecchia the other week and he's a fisheries biologist. And yeah. when I asked him, why do fish matter? He said that they're such a huge part of the biota. And I think, uh, and, you know, and they're everywhere on earth. And, you know, even if we're not necessarily eating them directly, fish are such an important part of the food chain. I imagine insects and invertebrates are probably even a bigger part of the, the biomass on the planet. And so thinking about them as a food source or just thinking about them, that's like one of the reasons why they matter, right? Yeah, right. They're like such a, a foundation for life because they are food for the his fish. You know, I right. know a lot of birders in the group. Sometimes I say, look, if you right. can't love insects for themselves, love them because they're the main food source for your favorite animal. Right. Maybe that's how you nature journal about them, right? You observe what right. you know, what your animals that you are, you know, focusing on are eating and realize that that's part of the whole web of life and and part of right. That. Yeah, let's go. Let's go into that now. Then, so um, how, what are some ways that people can nature journal? Like you're already mentioning, sort of this like contextual or relationships, ecological 
trophic yeah. you know, relationship um, aspect, but like how can we nature journal them um, in different ways? So for me, I'll show uh, some of you saw this at Nate, uh, Wild Wonder. This is such a simple one I did in when we were back in April, when we were early on in this whole quarantine thing. I wanted to nature journal. I think I'd been watching some of Jack's classes and feeling inspired. And I just went to my orange tree, right? And on my orange tree, it's like the, you know, all the aphids on my tree. Let me be sure I'm, oh, there we go. Getting that mirror thing, you know, doing a close up of the aphids, um, counting them. And then right there is, uh, there was a life and death struggle between a, oh, here it's on this side, between a, uh, a lacewing larva and a aphid right there in the orange tree, right? It's like, you, um, you don't have to go to the Serengeti to see yeah. as well. <laughs> If you just you know see these things as, as interesting, and I will say that, yeah. that you know they their behaviors are super interesting. Um, you know, I've been watching. I have two praying mantises right now that I've been watching them groom themselves a lot, yeah. and that grooming behavior is very complicated too, right? Like just like watching a larger animal groom itself. Yeah. Um, other things that I've done a lot is um, you know just. Even if you want to just get some insects, like this is a hornworm um, pupa that I got at the pet store as a, you know, they can buy these as feeders. These are like a, a tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm uh, caterpillar. This is what they turn into. And it, it makes a fascinating thing. This was one of our local yeah. bug parties we had, right? Looking at bugs together. Um, and then just going out in your yard and seeing, like, what do I see out here, you know? Um, for me, like, I'll go out and and see what bugs. Let's see, I was looking for one of those pages where I went out. And, oh, here, it's in the same one as the aphids. Um, what's, what beetles are in my yard today, right? This is just my front yard in San Mateo. And, yeah, I'm an entomologist, so, you know, it took me only five minutes to find three different <laughs> families of beetles. But they're there, right? Like I just had right. to poke around for a few minutes. Like, you know, how in five minutes are you gonna necessarily find three, you know, lizards to nature right. to the yard? Not so easily. So um, that's one thing I really like doing. And then I do a lot of, you know, I do a lot of art that isn't strictly nature journaling where I'll just, I like to draw bugs. I like to draw bugs right. that are realistic. I like to draw bugs that are fanciful. I like to do different, you know, abstract designs with bugs. Yeah. I sew a lot, so I love, you know, bugs as patterns, as as colors, as fabric, as, you know, a lot of, they're so inspirational for art. So, you know, to not even say you have to be strictly nature journaling, you can also just be inspired by them. And they're great models, right? Especially if yeah. you have um, access to a pinned bug or things like that, or or those books are great. They're just like having a big insect collection to look at. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so I think that's actually a perfect time. And Kit just um, posted this comment here that I'll um, put up. Oh, good field guides. You know, there's going to be a new Peterson's guide. I just learned my favorite. Let me get up on my ladder here. Some of my favorite field guides up here are um, this is a great North American field guide, the Kaufman Guide by Eric Eaton um, and Ken Kaufman. This is this one's a really great one. It's got lots of good photographs. Um, and yeah, and my friend John Abbott is actually about to do a revision of the Peterson's Guide. He, he just mm. posted on his social media. Um, all He's a very great nature photography. If any of you have heard me plugging the bug shot photography workshops, he's one of the leaders of those if you ever want to mm. Insect photography, those are some of the most amazing workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got a big, the new Peterson's Guide is going to be one of his. We have a lot in California, too, if one of the people in California, too. There's a lot of regional, right? And with insects, you often need a regional guide, right. uh, you know, because we're talking about a group that has a million species worldwide. And like here in California, we have over 100,000 insect species recorded. So you're not going to find a field guide that's absolutely complete. Um, got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, great question, Kit. Thanks for that. So um, how do people get started? You know, like you mentioned that you saw three, you rec quickly found three families of beetles in your backyard. Um, for people who are new and aren't entomologists, um, 
I mean, you've said, you've used the word seeing multiple times. And I know this happens to me sometimes where I, I take for granted that I'm seeing something and other people aren't. So do you have like tips to help people develop their observation skills to, to start finding the thing, the bugs that they can nature journal? Yeah. So a clear thing about bugs is that they are often hiding, right? We talked earlier about how they're a food source for so many things. And this, this being a food source for so many things is part of what's driven their evolution and why they have interesting defenses and interesting behaviors. And it also means that a lot of times they're not in your face out there for every butterfly that you see flying by when you're hiking, there's yeah. hundreds of insects that are hiding just out of your mm -hmm. view. But if you start doing some of the entomologist things, we're notoriously slow hikers because we like to like go up to the foliage and pick at things, turning mm -hmm. over logs or rocks. I mean, you can't, like I can't go hiking and walk past the log without trying to like break it apart. And then there's some really good tools like, um, you know, your standard insect net. Um, and I can give you a link for a place where you can get one of those for, you know, a student net that I use in my classes. You can get one of those for under $20. And then my favorite tool of all time, in fact, when, we were going to do Wild Wonder in person this year. I was going to do a field trip where we were going to actually make these using, you can make these using salsa cups and plastic straws, but this is called an aspirator. Entomologists call it a pooter. And this is such a useful tool for nature journaling bugs, because if you see a little bug now, it has to be what I call pootable. It has to be small enough that it'll suck up through there. So, you know, latent bug size is starting to get to the limit of pootable. But if you're looking at small bugs, and if you can use this in conjunction with your net, you put one end in your mouth, suck up the bug, and now you have it in a little vial. And these actually, if you buy these kits of these, they come with little lids and multiple vials. So now I've got a little vial I can use um, for nature journaling uh, bugs. And, and you know, and another thing that I think, Jack often gives the little, um, the little square ones of these, where you can, um, you know, the little square, oh, here, here it is, these, right? You can also go to like a plastic store and get just a little, like a little square box, clear plastic box that's flat too. And those are great. I often like to put a bug in those. So just yeah. all the carrying a little something with or without a magnifier. In fact, uh -huh. insect photographers use the ones without magnifiers a lot where we just keep one, try to keep one that's not too scratched up and you can yeah. photograph the insect through that. So, uh -huh. um, you know, starting to just, you've got to hunt a little and that gets fun too, right? That like satisfies that part of us that likes Pokemon or Animal Crossing, right? There's that human need to kind of like explore and collect and yeah. you can totally do that with insects too. So like the part of you that has your birder checklist can also get really satisfied by checking off your insect families or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that's really cool. I like to use iNaturalist for that also. And I always try to get um, for my iNaturalist, I always try to take photos of um, different different um, pollinators and, and bees mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So um, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, those are some those are some great uh, tools that I think are helpful. And sort of, I'm noticing something that I want to bring up here and see what you think about this. But um, how do you feel like when people are um, like, what are some ethical kind of um, thoughts for people? Because I've I've received some feedback recently on my Instagram. Like, I'm always catching stuff. My my first impulse is to catch things and. Um, you know, learn about them that way, like interact with things. Um, and so I received feedback from one, I mean, basically from one person, but several times mm -hmm. about that. And she was really uncomfortable with that. And these were things, you know, like not like endangered species or anything. And, and my argument was that, well, actually, I won't say what my argument is. Why don't you, <laughs> like, where, do you where do you stand and how do people, you know, in terms of like catching insects um, to observe them or sort of inter interfering with insects? Like, what would you say like your standpoint is and what what should people think about who are considering their impact um, when they're out there i love this question this idea because it's it's a really interesting area for me because you know full confession as an entomologist 
almost every entomology class that I took um, as I was studying to become an entomologist at UC Davis when I got my undergraduate there in entomology, almost every class I took required an insect collection and took us out to go, you know, so these animals that you love, you're also collecting, you're putting them in cyanide jars, you're sticking things in them. And this yeah. is an ethical thing. Like I, I don't, I never enjoy killing a bug. And I don't do a lot of um, collecting in that regard anymore at all because I have a big collection now that I can use to teach. And part of it is just the necessity of you can't learn to identify insects without specimens. It's just the matter of the way that it works, the way that this diversity is, is cataloged and represented and, and how we learn our skills. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I very much, um, when I go out and I interact with something in the wild, I'm definitely gonna let it go. If it's a log, you always roll it back. It drives me crazy when people tear up something and then they don't put it back because that's a valuable yeah. habitat, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and that's that's a huge difference in philosophy, right? In, in nature journaling is whether or not you completely don't interfere at all, or if you are willing to take a bug, put it in a, you know, in a container, spend some time drawing it and then let it go. I know from my um, studying of insects that as long as I'm, you know, not just letting it, I don't let it go later out of my car window. I don't let it go later at my home because that's not its habitat. I let it go there on the plant that I found it on and the, under the log I found it on um, and things like that. To me, I'm, you know, a huge part of what I do is representing these animals that are so underrepresented and underappreciated that to me like having some captive bugs that get open prodded to show you guys you know i try to watch their signs to see if they're they're done for the day and i put them away and i i rotate them i actually have lists when i was doing in-person things where we had you know they were like they were almost unionized in the sense that i could say okay now you're on shift but now you get yeah. you don't go to a class for a few days because you just did a class right. um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, I love the ethics, right? I always say to people, I would much rather have you worried about ethics when it comes to insects because so few people are, right? Mm -hmm. So few people regard them enough to, um, to do that. But yeah, I've, I've had I've had people bring up similar issues with, right. with me. Like I did my, I, I just, I'm right now about to have a paper published on work I did with a Smithsonian researcher, Terry Irwin, who sadly passed away this year. Um, and I, we went in the Amazon and we did what's called canopy fogging. And we actually used insecticide in the rainforest to mm -hmm. collect large quantities of insects. And that's, you know, I've had people when I presented that research have, have real issues with it. And I understand that. I'd much rather have people care that much, right? Because so often, right the main reflex of humanity is to hate them and squish yeah. them. So, so it sounds like one of the things that you're, you're doing is you're balancing, um, you know, like what are, what are the pros and the cons? And I think that sometimes people have like a gut reaction to, yeah. Oh, that, you, that animal, that one insect is being disturbed. Um, and that seems like something is really direct. Whereas the echo, ecosystem disturbance caused by your consumer choices on some like Borneo oh, okay. ecosystem yeah. is less direct. And so your your choice about what, what kind of palm oil or whatever you're using could yeah. be having a bigger impact than you picking up like one single bug. But also you're saying that, you know, like that people learn from that one bug and that will help them make like bigger level choices. Uh, so I think that's really important. And then are there any things, you know, people should like, like clear lines, you know, like with certain species or, or whatever, where you should just be like, okay, don't mess with that at all. Or is there anything like that? You know, we have so little, unfortunately we have so little documentation of what insects are seriously threatened. I mean, we know yeah. now, unfortunately, that the monarch population out here is seriously threatened. We do have a few federally listed endangered insect species, but that's for lack of coverage of those species by by Endangered Species Act and, and that sort of thing. They're very right. um, often neglected. And I was thinking of this as we were talking too, is one of the things about insects that's so important that I really am trying to emphasize a lot lately, and especially because we're all spending a lot of time at home. If you're interested in preserving something like the orangutan, right? And you're worried about palm oil, you're worried about conservation of habitats. What you can do, right, is make 
consumer choices. You can donate to conservation funds. You can promote that sort of education. A really cool thing about insects is that every single one of us who has a little piece of land, whether, you know, I have this, this little lot in San Mateo where I live, it's my, where my home is, I actually have a small insect habitat that I am the game warden of, right? And I make choices and I made a choice to destroy my front lawn and replace it with a native garden. And mm -hmm. each, I, you know, I preached about it before, but until I actually yeah. saw the difference in the diversity of animals that I saw in my yard yeah. after doing that, it's huge. So we all have these little choices with insects. We, if you own property or even if you have an apartment and you have a balcony and you can plant things on it, right? Like you have a little area that you get to be in charge of and you can make a difference in your neighborhood with planting native plants, doing things like right now, a lot of us are tempted to rake up all of our leaves. If you can leave some leaves under, especially in garden beds, that's an incredible habitat for so many caterpillars and um, small invertebrates and things like it's an overwintering habitat. And if yeah. we keep raking things and leaving bare lawns everywhere, um, that's a huge part of the of what's happened with insects and why we've seen a drop in diversity. Great. So it, it sounds like uh, we should, not, you know, like plant some habitat, create habitat, and then don't worry about like picking up bugs and like catching lizards if we're, uh, you know, promoting their their habitat seems like has a probably much bigger impact. Yeah, and put them back, be gentle with them, yeah. don't stress them out too much, you know, pay attention, yeah. be ethical about it. But yeah, it's difficult to apply some of the same ethics to insects that we apply to mammals or other vertebrates. It's it's a lot different world with right. in terms of their lifespans, their their habits, system. their complexity of their behavior. It's it's just very right. different. You know, you okay. have to figure it out, yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I, you know, it seemed like that was, that came up for me recently. So I want to bring that up here. We have a, um, a comment from Kit that um, I think is a good one because I tend to forget about this um, where I live. I'm just wait, my light goes off automatically. Oh, okay. so, um, <laughs> so for people who are, you know, in very cold winter areas or have snow, what can they do? Um, any suggestions? Yeah. Oh, I just I just did a library program called the Bugs and Bugsicles that for kids that was all about insects in winter. In the winter, a lot of insects are going to be right hunkering down. There's going to be like praying mantis egg cases, right? You'll see a lot of these around. Some people are lucky enough to even find these on their Christmas tree. So to what? give you some context, like yeah, I know I've never been that lucky. I've I've heard stories, but um. Yeah, because the female praying mantis, once she kind of realizes it's the end of the warm season, will start laying their egg cases like this. And most of what you're seeing is foam. In fact, all of these have already hatched. One of them is yeah. big one in the bottom. I got about 120 mantises out of. But they make that kind of foam with what's called their accessory glands and their reproductive system, and it packs in and gives them a uh, thing. I do want to, I'm going to show you an insect. I'm fortunate enough that, um, don't be too jealous, I live near Jack. Jack mm -hmm. Law, John Muir Law is one of our, you know, gurus of this group. And uh, he called me the other day. He said, Stephanie, the rain beetles are out. And I said, I know, Jack, I've heard the rain beetles are out. So in California, we have these really cool beetles. And oh, so the end of that story is that Jack was literally at my door with a rain beetle in his hand. Oh, wow. It's really so, big. This is a rain beetle. And they are a so related to scarabs. You can see how fuzzy they are, too. They're yeah. super fuzzy. And the thing about these rain beetles that's so interesting is um, they are one of the rare groups of insects that are more diverse in the temperate regions. And we have about 20 species of them in California. And I, I saw a statistic that the people who study them think that there's probably about like 30 additional species um, out there. And what these guys do, do you see, this is a male and he has these antennae that kind of fan out like that, right? Yeah. And those are for smelling the pheromones of the female. And this is something you see a lot with insects. If you're a very short-lived adult, and these guys will live as an adult for only a few days to a few weeks, they actually have such a short lifespan as adults that there's nothing I can feed this guy because he doesn't eat. He doesn't have functioning mouth parts. Mm -hmm. So um, these guys will, uh, what they do is they have to find a way to trigger and to coordinate their mating. And so for these particular beetles, they're called rain beetles because in Northern California here, we get no rain at all in the summer. 
And then it starts raining, hopefully, right, in the winter. And when we get our first few really ground soaking rains, this isn't like the little dribbly bits that like get a few dots on the asphalt. This is like when you're really getting soaked. And what that rain does is it actually drives the females out of the burrows and then the males emerge take flight and they're buzzing all over the place. They sound like little helicopters. The first time I got to see these, I was getting pelted by them on a hike in Vacaville in the middle of the rainstorm. Um, and yeah, and they they have this really interesting life cycle where they only come out as adults in the winter and they spend most of their lives as larvae under the ground. The adult stage is the, the minor part of their yeah. life cycle. So there are some insects, right? That's California. That's where we're not getting snow in California. Right, um, so it seems like the other thing you showed was the um, the Uthaca and so yeah. like that there's signs of insects. So maybe yeah. if you're in a winter place, you could study like, I don't know if they have um, beetle boring beetles or yeah. other, other insects. Yeah. Often, I don't know if any of you have ever done this where you're on a hike on a cold morning and you open up a log and you literally see steam coming out of the log. Mm. Like there's so much biological energy in there and so much heat being produced. And so that's another thing, right? Like looking under things. Right now, um, if you're in a snowy environment, you're going to have a lot of things that are like dragonfly nymphs, which are the aquatic nymph of a dragonfly. I'm kicking myself because I literally had a model of one here and I'm tidying up before this, taking props out from other classes. Yeah. But yeah, they'll be under, you know, under the ice in ponds and streams. Um, things are going to be as eggs. If you're talking about like butterflies and moths, a lot of those are going to be in their chrysalises. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's, there's, you can look for these signs of them, um, especially if you live in a winter environment. Right. Or maybe the winter is when you, you know, like birders do this too, right? They have the time of year that's really great. And then the time of year where they hunker down, right. that's when you get out your photographs, you get out your, your, uh, your models, or if you have a pinned insect or something like that, and you just play around with that. And yeah, that's really cool. There's a, um, there's a question here about life cycle, but first I want to continue on this winter thing. Mm -hmm. um, you're mentioning ways that you can, um, you know, you work from your photos and stuff like that during the winter. Mm -hmm. What about, um, <laughs> what about it doesn't work if I wave my hands. Um, I can suggest your more as we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> more than. <So laughs> what about, you know, um, it seems like one of the things that's really accessible about um, bugs, um, not just insects, but other arthropods as well, is um, that a lot of them make actually um, quite good pets and easy pets. And so mm -hmm. I wanna talk about kids at some point and nature journaling with kids, <laughs> but you know, like if you're somewhere that has snow, yeah. It seems like, you know, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, having having pets, uh, observation pets or ones that are, are more handleable and ones that can be observed in nature journaled and how that could work maybe in a winter situation, quarantine situation. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people got excited about um, pet insects and stuff like that. So could you share a little bit about how that could be a, a nature yeah. journal pet? Yeah. So uh, in general, here's the quick like word about um, about pet insects and, and other terrestrial arthropods. In general, um, in the US, so we've got two things that regulate them, right? We've got the US Department of Agriculture and we've also in California, we've got our own Department of Agriculture and things like that. So we often have two different layers of regulation. In general, like if you want an insect, things that are predatory are often much more easy to obtain legally, right? Um, you know, you can always bring in things from the outside and keep them in your house if you research and learn, right? One of the maddening things about insects for me is I often have kids, they'll do something like catch a ladybug and she's going to be their pet. And ladybugs are predators or they get aphids to feed them. No, they're going to put them in with some lettuce and they're going to die in a few days. Yeah. Um, so to, you know, that being said, look up the information online. A lot of predators. So, um, you, you know, we, we have some nature journaling friends who went and got these praying mantises. Um, so, you know, I've got a couple of praying mantises. These arrived at my house on election day. These are raised, captive raised, and that's another huge thing in insects. If you're going to get something from your local area that you can then let go, that's fine. And you're not introducing something that's not native. This is like an African praying mantis. This is going to get to be rather large. And this guy um, was raised by somebody in Los Angeles area. Um, U.S. Mantis is the company I bought these from. Oh, and yeah, you can see they're grooming and stuff. They, they clean themselves off often when you bring them out. Um, so, you know, things like that. 
Uh, tarantulas, again, there's a big, there's hundreds of kinds of tarantulas and there's a lot of really great information about what are good because there are beginner species of tarantulas and then there are ones that take a lot more specialized care. Um, and then I would emphasize again, and I can always help people with this, they can contact me through beetalady.com to get captive bred only because we have a really horrible problem with what's called brown boxing, people going into rainforest collecting tarantulas, literally shoving them in a brown box, cardboard yeah. box and mailing them. And that's not only unethical, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for the animal, it's mm -hmm. it's not good, right? right. So, um, but there's a lot of uh, amazing people who are breeding, um, breeding tarantulas out there. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, other insects, those, that death feigning beetle that I showed you, I actually just did a virtual birthday party for a little girl in Chicago who's turning six. And that is hands down the recommendation that I gave her parents and always give. And they yeah. bought they bought some of those death feigning beetles from an outfit right. called Bugs in Cyberspace that right. also uh, breeds them. And they're they're great. They're sturdy animals. They're easy to care for. And, you know, again, a nice thing is you saw how small, like this is my ghost mantis. It's going to get bigger and it'll get moved to a bigger enclosure. But right now, this is this is what it needs. Right, right. Nice little, so they can, you know, as long as you're willing to care for them and, and do that, they can make an amazing thing to watch and to connect with. Right. Right. And it's, I know for me that, um, you know, during, so during quarantine or during some of these like really rainy days, um, I have a couple um, pet tarantulas and it's been really nice to have those to Nature Journal. Um, just yeah. like, you know, having orchids in your house or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that is a really, I'm trying to find one of the pages where here are some sketches of one of my, um, baby tarantulas right here. And, you know, it's just like, this is my oh, tarantula feet. Yeah, I was trying to nature journal every single day. And what I found was, um, you know, and, and this this applies to kids question and people in the winter is if it's if it's dark outside or you get off of work, it's already dark, but you go home and you have, you know, this it's like an endless source of um, fascination and questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that really, um, you know, and, and let's start maybe um, segue into kids a little bit here is. I feel like that um, that experience of being able to to interact and see that organism and be curious about it and combined with nature journaling, because like you mentioned, it is possible for that, like wanting to collect and wanting to have pets um, kind of instinct to kind of go in unhealthy or problematic directions, like with the, the ladybugs and the lettuce or whatever. Yeah. But um, it does seem like combined with nature journaling, it can actually be like a really powerful um, combination. So you have kids. Could you um, say anything about like having, um, you know, invertebrate pets combined with kids combined with, you know, like what have you seen? Yeah. I mean, you know, so kids love bugs. I, I, you know, entomologists often say that we're just the people who never outgrew that. <laughs> Um, there's just a special connection. You know, I often in my class, let's say there's like 30 kids at the library and I'll say, who love, 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 love bugs. And they'll all raise their hand and I'll say, I love you guys because if I go to a group of 30 grown ups at a party and I go, who love, love, loves bugs, I'll, you know, not usually get that many. In fact, I often get people who feel like they need to tell me how much they hate bugs because I'm an entomologist. Um, so yeah, I, kids get this connection with insects, which is really magical. And you know, my own kids, we, my kids joke about how someday when they're older, they'll be on a date and you know, tell me about your family. Well, my mom and the 30 tarantulas I grew up with and, and that sort of thing. But to have that accessibility, right? To have that, um, just that exposure that, that you know, kids very much, um, one of the things I really noticed with children is that they aren't afraid usually until adults yeah. to be right. And then I also see the gender roles get. You, you, you're jumping ahead of me with all my era. Uh, you're uh, I'm like, look at dang, she's already beating me to my questions. You, you go to a preschool or a kindergarten class, yeah. and almost always the girls are the ones who are. And you know, I don't want to stereotype any, but you see a lot more girls who are into the bugs. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what I think happens sometimes is that the boys who are afraid learn that they should like bugs, that they should be tough, right? They shouldn't show fear or vulnerability. And the girls learn that, oh, bugs aren't something that girls should like, right? Yeah. And you do see this shift that happens. It's really sad for me, right? And yeah. especially for other female entomologists, we see this shift of like, 
you have all these girls who are so gung ho about it, and then they start to disappear. They start yeah. to like one by one go away, and you lose them. Um, so I think that for me, just having children who are exposed to these things and to remind myself that for all nature and all animals and so much of life, right? I mean, including how we interact with other humans, that they're learning from us and they're learning from our example, not just what you yeah. say, right? It's not whether or not you say to respect mm -hmm. a caterpillar that you find out in your garden. It's and I and I see educators who model the opposite. I have been in classrooms where I've seen a teacher get a Kleenex and squish a spider in front of the kids as a lesson in how <laughs> how do we deal with spiders. And and even in front of me, I'm like, you, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Don't do this, please. You know. So um, yeah. it's really important if they see our fascination. If when yeah. you are out with your your kids or you know, or, or your friends, right? We're all, we're social creatures, right? And you go, wow, look at this cool thing, right? You're modeling something. Um, you're modeling a love and an appreciation and, and people like that. I, I don't think we all wanna be as jaded as so many of us are, right? Mm -hmm. I think we wanna be kids again and we wanna love life and what's around us. And Yeah, and I think the nature journaling can really allow for that. Like I think it was um, Linda that mentioned earlier, she used to, have an aversion to bugs, but through nature journaling, learn to appreciate them. And there is something, you know, like yeah. and you draw it and you you put the attention to it and you're like, wow, the, look at the the iridescence and you start to 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 kind of build more of a relationship with it. That really changes. Um, in my experience as um, an educator with kids, I've definitely noticed um, and tried to pay attention to like this transition from um, curiosity and interest and excitement to kind of like aversion or fear or um, mm -hmm. also using using yeah. it when you learn that you can use it to freak other people out then yeah. it can become like this power thing and then that can exacerbate um, someone's you know maybe slight aversion or uh, whatever and that becomes gendered as well like often in our culture mm -hmm. um, and and so I definitely have spent a lot of time trying to make sure that little girls are okay sh showing that they like snakes and, and insects and stuff like that. Um, but one other thing around gender that I want to get into now um, is uh, this was in a, this wasn't with insects, but it was on a, um, a reptile and amphibian, a herping um, hike at a, um, I'm not going to name the the organization, but it was a you know, well-known nature organization. And I wasn't leading the group, but um, was there with my nature journal and nature journaling, but everyone else was kind of just looking. And there was ki a lot of kids there. Um, and then there was like a herpetologist and um, a couple other people and a lot of adults. And um, they, one thing I noticed in the language was everyone gendering the, um, the, the animals that we found as males, like, oh, he, this, he, that. Um, <laughs> talking about lizards and snakes. And I've noticed that also with bugs that everybody, almost everybody in English genders bugs as males, like, you know? And so um, I think, especially with insects, it seems like um, a really good place to learn about, um, you know, like, you know, gender is very different in bees or whatever. And so um, <laughs> what do you think about that? And what's your experience with that? And like, what can we learn from bugs other than just gender but like it seems like there's things we can learn from insects about like even what the individual what what an individual actually is so could you speak to like yeah. that a little bit yeah i'm laughing because to me one of the most glaring examples of how deep misogyny can be in our culture is the bee movie that jerry seinfeld oh. cartoon yeah. movie where the bees were boys and they were going to work. And it was like, really, you had to take this one thing where, you know, it's all run by females. Yeah. <laughs> and you couldn't just let that be what it was. You had to mess it up, right? Yeah. So yeah, the, I mean, the Hymenoptera are a great place. I love, I love the faces of little girls when yeah. I talk about bees uh -huh. or I talk about, um, you know, even if you, if you don't even look at honeybees or social bees, right? 
only females can sting in the hymenoptera. The males can't because the stinger was evolved from the ovipositor, from the egg layer. Girls love that. They love hearing about that. Or, uh, you know, most of the time with arthropods, especially terrestrial arthropods, insects and spiders, females are larger than males. Mm -hmm. They are because, you know, I do um, sometimes with some of my classes, we dissect grasshoppers and you dissect a grasshopper and the it's like her body is like, so much of her body mass is her ovaries and her eggs and that sort of thing. I'm not waving my arms enough still. Um, you know, it's it's amazing you know, yeah. this this difference, right? That and that can be really fun to teach girls. So yeah, it is really interesting how we have this total insistence on like heing herps. Yeah. You know, and we see them as masculine. Yeah. Um I, I like, you know, there's a big debate often in the bug world of whether we want to anthropomorphize our bugs very much. Like, oh, you know, and in general, in the zookeeping world, right? Um, it's, right. Do you name animals? Do you give them a, a, a cute name, a name, or, or are they just a specimen of that species and you mm -hmm. refer to them as that species, right? And to mm -hmm. me, with insects, I don't think it hurts to, to make them more human, right? To mm -hmm. point out that um, you know, I love pointing out to kids that they they need shelter, they need food, they don't need their families in the same way that we do, unless they're a social insect, right? But um, you know, a lot of times they don't ever meet their parents, but that they have similar needs, right? And because I think once you can relate to them better right. um, in that regard, and so for me, like I'll often give them names and with my specimens when I do know their gender, that's definitely on there. I'll talk about, you know, almost every, I only have one male tarantula right now mm -hmm. uh, because preferably we usually buy females because they, they live longer, they get bigger. And, um, you know, when you have a female tarantula, you can have it for 25 years, a male you're only going to have for about five or seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I often make a point of pointing that out. You know, you've met my tarantula, Barbara. So often giving them names like that rather than yeah. or, you right. know, yeah. it's nice to kind of soften it in that sense mm -hmm. to, to make them realize that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of cool things, you know, with insects. And one of the things I love, like, especially with my high school class is we will often go to the Cal Academy to their insect collection mm -hmm. and we will see Ganadromorph. Um, you know, and these are because of the way insect chromosomal inheritance occurs. And there's a, a few different ways in which insects inherit their chromosomes, yeah. um, depending on the group. But some insects can actually be bilaterally two different genders. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, it's more common than than you'd think because a lot of times you can't tell the difference. But mm -hmm. if it happens in something like a butterfly where the males have one color wing and the females have another, or a stag beetle where the males have a jo lot, big oh jaw, you'll have literally a specimen that's physically half male, half female. Wow. And, and that's really cool to see, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, I often would cringe because sometimes um, in the tours, they would call it a mistake, a genetic mistake. Mm -hmm. and I didn't want any kids who, you know, can mm -hmm. identify as trans to think that they were a mistake. Um, right. but it's, it's, you know, once we learn more about this kind of the diversity, right, mm -hmm. um, of, of nature and, and of these animals, the more right that you see, they don't, you know, insects don't conform to our ideas right, right. of gender roles, especially if you're talking honeybees, right? Yeah. That's a totally yeah. Different yeah, and I love the concept of like the super organism also, I think yeah. just really yeah. useful and kind of puts puts nature a little bit in perspective and puts us in into perspective as well. And yeah, and you touched on that. Yeah, exactly. That kind of like being part of a collective and, mm -hmm. you know, and we wouldn't go as far as some of the social insects in, in terms of uh, sacrificing all of our individuality, but right, mm -hmm. like that collective responsibility is a huge yeah. thing for human beings, especially this year, right, with everything we're dealing with, right? Yeah. 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 That's super cool. Well, I could talk about these things with you forever, but just I'm going to look at some of these other questions. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned um, life cycle. I think you showed um, your hornworm page. Mm -hmm. and, um, Riley was asking, I actually had this, I was thinking the same thing, um, but I'm going to, um, Riley just was curious about um, if you could talk a little bit more about life cycles and maybe certain it's techniques, nature journaling techniques that would be useful for that. Do you have any, um, I, I wish I had, I, I've never really, been super meticulous about that. I know I think um, Akshay and Gargi have nature journaled their um, 
mantids through different um, molds. Do you have any pages or anything about, um, cause I think that's another really cool one um, to help put us um, into perspective that so many other um, animals go through a metamorphosis and, and we don't. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about life stages and how to nature journal that? Yeah, I love that because it's it's such an often neglected um, area, right? And even even with entomologists, um, yeah. I've I've described a number of new species of beetles. In none of those descriptions did I describe what the larva or the pupa yeah. look like because it's so you know that's such another stage in understanding the animal that for a lot of things we don't have that association. Um, and I'm gonna take this as a chance too, to tie in something that I was hoping to talk about because it ties in both the girls thing yeah. in Loving Bugs and the life cycle thing. Um, there's a, a naturalist that I want every nature journaler to learn about. This is mm -hmm. one of my missions. And, and I told you that when we talked before, I ended up afterwards totally kicking yeah. myself about, about it. So there's a woman named Maria Marianne um, and Maria Marianne, as you can see here, lived from 1647 to 1717. That's a long, long time ago when it comes to science and natural history. Mm -hmm. And she should not only be appreciated by nature journalists, but by, I think she should be up there with Charles Darwin when we talk about innovators and in, especially in the natural sciences. But one of the really important things was the way she used art. So she was born in Germany, and there's a lot of really great books that I can recommend to people about her. Um, there's a children's book called Summer Birds. This is by um, Marguerite Engel. Um, there's, if you look her up on, you know, on your local bookstore, this is just a collection of a lot of her butterfly drawings. And some of these are going to look familiar to you guys because these are done so long ago that they're out of copyright. So you often see these like oh. you know, that cute little decorative pillow with a butterfly on it. It's sometimes her art that's gotten like how wow. many of us have seen these on like tote bags or things like that right um, and here's another book it's called the girl who drew butterflies how maria marion's art changed mm -hmm. science by joyce sidman um so let me tell you a quick bit about her because this is why she's so cool this woman was not only an artist she was also she made paints so she made and sold paints so she mixed colors she um was a naturalist and she was an explorer and published uh, person. So her, she, her mom remarried. Her stepfather, his name was Jacob Marl, and he was a still life artist. So he did a lot of like botanical still lifes, and she would collect butterflies for him and caterpillars to add to his still lifes. And then she got super into collecting butterflies and caterpillars and raising her own silk moths. Mm -hmm. And you have to put this too into the context of the time. At the time in Europe, a lot of people had all these superstitions about butterflies and moths and caterpillars. And caterpillars are actually seen as being evil by a lot of people. So she yeah. literally risked her life collecting caterpillars oh and feeding them and raising them to see what they turned into because she would have been accused of practicing witchcraft had yeah. she been doing this. So she, um, she married, she ended up living in Holland for a lot of the time and she supported herself by teaching art lessons to aristocrats. She also painted like a lot of times at this point, there were a lot of people who were collecting plants that were uncommon yeah. in Europe, like pineapple plants. And she would uh, paint the botanical collections of people who were wealthy, right? And through this and, and also selling paintings and selling her paints that she formulated and made, she and her daughters went on an expedition to Suriname. Um, and so that's now uh, Guiana. Um, and she went on this trip um, and published this book. This is the largest book I own. This is such a cool book. Um, this is her a reproduction of her actual 1705 publication of going on this expedition, drawing the animals, painting the animals she saw. He is the person that we can thank for the name Bird Eater Tarantula because here I have this page marked. She um, did a painting of tarantula. And one of them was eating a hummingbird. Oh, and yeah. the first times that these tarantulas were observed. I mean, think about this in context of time. This is like so long before Charles Darwin. Yeah. And she and her two daughters went on this trip in the jungle. And actually, the sad end to the story is she ultimately died of malaria, which she contracted mm -hmm. on this trip. But mm -hmm. what she did, you know, she had not, she didn't even have microscopes. She was 
taking the time to observe animals, and we can go back to even to the questions we were talking about. Um, a lot of people nature journal bugs without disturbing them, right? You can notice there are caterpillars in your area and go back, check yeah. on them, see if yeah. what happens in the next week. You know, Mark Simmons, he has those spiders that are right near yeah. the library near his house and he's been going yeah. and checking on them, right? Especially some of these things that stay put like caterpillars that have a host plant. Um, so she is such a prime example of how an entomology, and this happened with Charles Darwin, this happened with uh, Langstroth, who studied a lot of the bee behaviors, um, it happened with E.O. Wilson. We're just sitting and observing with a notebook has led to huge discoveries in entomology, right? right? And, um, and, and cataloging these, these ideas and these, you know, observations can be really big. So, you know, here's somebody who revolutionized the way she documented metamorphosis in a way that had not been done before and documented tropical diversity. And her main tool in doing that was art, right? Yeah, that's observational so art. Um, so yeah. I really encourage people, there's also some, you know, longer, thicker adult biographies of her. She's just a fascinating um, person that I, I really, uh, think we should all know about, um, especially in the Nature Journal community and for girls, right? Because a lot of this stuff she started when she was 14 years old. She was doing these drawings. So that's really cool to show some teenage girls or some young girls like yeah. somebody who was still a kid was doing this, was was drawing these drawings and, and had this amazing observational talent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're sort of taking this um, on yourself to kind of like help promote her because it feels like definitely one of those things where uh, the the gender bias has, you know, she should be more famous and well-known than she is, but a lot of times there's historically and today, you know, things that are not, a lot of times the female scientists are not um, getting the credit that they deserve. So I'm so glad that you're doing that. Um, that's super awesome. And do you have, do you have any page? I'm looking through my journal to see if I have any, good metamorphosis or life cycle stuff and I'm not mm -hmm. seeing any. I think I've drawn molts, a couple like um tarantula molts. You know, I times. try. I don't I don't have the journal but it'll take me a second to find the journal it's in. But one of the things that I really try to do, and again, this is one of the ways that I really love those Japanese books, oh. is you know, I draw a lot of drawings of big beautiful horned beetles but they're pupae or fascinating. This is the pupil stage. So this is like the equivalent of a chrysalis for um, a Dynasties Granti uh, rhinoceros beetle. So, you know, if you, even if you can't see this, the thing itself, right? Maybe you see, cause it's gonna be pretty rare that you see all life cycle stages of, a, of an insect. Um, yeah. Maybe you see the butterfly and then you go back and you ask yourself, um, oh, and, and I meant to also uh, promote this site I don't know if any of you haven't heard of the Caterpillar Lab. Google, we'll also have to add this to the links. This is this amazing, they're, oh gosh, I'm gonna forget which state they're based in, but they're run by a guy who's a skilled insect photographer. He, this is my brand new Caterpillar a day calendar that mm. I enjoy. It's, this is the life cycle edition. So it actually goes through the life cycles. So there are a lot of resources. So let's say you you see the butterfly, you journal about the butterfly, don't stop there. There's, right. you know, we're putting it all together, Marley. You're in the winter, you saw a butterfly this summer. It was really cool. What yeah. does the caterpillar look like? What is its host plant? What is its chrysalis look like? Mm -hmm. What are the, you know, what is known? And what's also fun with entomology is discovering what's unknown, right? To go yeah, yeah, exactly. Out. Nobody knows. No, right. nobody knows that, right? Um, and videos too. I love some. You know, the Caterpillar Lab just recently did a live broadcast that was so great. He was like live zooming some like um, parasitoids on caterpillars and leaf miner caterpillars that are between the two layers of a leaf, yeah. like, like mining, just eating the cells there. Um, so you can all, or Deep Look, the KQED series, if you Google that on YouTube, they do all these great little videos about insects that are like six minutes, you know? You've missed your chance to see bugs today. It's five o'clock and oh my gosh, it's already dark outside. <laughs> Sit down in front of your computer with your nature journal and like watch one of those videos and you can pause it and go back and yeah. draw the bug. Yeah, definitely. yeah I've used, um, for a while I was drawing tarantulas from, you. 
YouTubers who do tarantulas because there's a lot of them and I would just yeah. pause the video, draw from the video. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not the same as nature journaling from like real life, but I would, it's yeah. definitely, you can apply a nature journaling perspective to a video and definitely practice a lot of the, the skills. Um, on that note, I think it would be fun. Um, you know, maybe the people who are on here right now um, would be down for this, but maybe we could get out a bug yeah. Um, you could put on your uh, maybe yeah. document camera. Say what? Yeah. Any requests? And, yeah. Well, let's let's um maybe you could come up with like um five options and then people can yeah. vote for it in the comments. Um, ones that make good models. Somebody mentioned crumpet. Crumpet is the Barbados whip scorpion. Um, those of you and I'll mention this that I'm doing this. You know, before the pandemic, I was doing a, an in person bug drawing day at my house here. Yeah, that was so fun. Crumpet, so fun. One of the you know silver linings is that now we're doing it virtually. So if you look up Virtual Bug Drawing Day on Facebook, it's a private group, but I come on and do a live video. Um, and I do try to record those. I forgot this last month. I keep meaning to go on and record a quick video to make up for that. Um, but I did record the previous months and you can draw along and it's just basically like life figure drawing with a live bug. Um, so I, I brought out my Jerusalem cricket for that this month, and she's really cool. She's one of the biggest insects you'll find in this area. Yeah. Uh, I have tarantulas. I have millipedes. Uh, who else might be good? Okay, so wait. Let's. Um, yeah. um, let's for, okay, do we want a whip scorpion? Do we want a glow spot cockroach? A tarantula? Or a, um, or a Jerusalem cricket. How about that? Four options. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So everybody, yeah. right now, if you don't, if you don't post in YouTube um, or on Facebook, um, we won't be able to see. So um, go ahead and post whether you want a, a whip scorpion, a millipede, a tarantula, a Jerusalem cricket, or a glow. What was the? A was glow spot the? cockroach. Okay, so um, it says, they don't actually glow in captivity, but they do glow in the wild. Okay, well, someone's voting for a scorpion, even though that oh, wasn't. Well, well what, what scorpion? I bet maybe they said. Oh, okay, okay. I um, do scorpion, scorpions too. Okay, we got we got one cockroach vote, and then Eva is asking about the cockroach. I don't know if she's actually voting for it, and then one person saying they trust you to pick whatever you want. So. Hmm. Oh, now someone else says tarantula. Oh, now another cockroach, another cockroach. So oh, let's see. That's a lot of cockroach. That's a lot of cockroach. And and um, so let's see. One, two. I I I think that the cockroach is kind of winning right now. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting that, folks. People are braver um, and breaking all the stereotypes right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. We'll talk about the warty glow spot cockroaches then. Okay, so the right. warty glow spot cockroaches, and let me bring out my spool here. Okay, these guys are from South America, and they're an interesting cockroach. Um, Wait, hold on, Stephanie. Let me get, um, I'm going to, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to nature journal while you're showing oh, and talking. Oh, okay. so I'll get my document camera up here. Yeah. In fact, maybe what I'll do is I'll have the document camera so you can appreciate one of the things that happens when you keep captive cockroaches um, is they often, there's often a lot of them. <laughs> so this oh, oh, right. maybe appreciate, ooh, oh, and I see one with an egg case. Okay, so this is the tank. Oh, in case any of you are wondering, this strip right here at the top of my tank is Vaseline. There yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, there are cockroaches that can, here, I'm going to switch my cameras. Oh, um, that was turning it off. Um, there are cockroaches that can climb on glass and others that cannot. Um, okay, so here's the tank so you guys can get kind of an idea when I lift this up and we see, let me zoom out a little. Yeah, that's probably pretty good. Okay, and you can appreciate maybe how many of these there are. Um, so these are warty glow spot cockroaches, and they are a South American species of cockroach. They live in the. Oh rain my gosh! Oh, and here's that one with an egg case. Here we go. Here's the one with an egg case. Um, here, maybe let's let's bring out her. 
and a boy. You see how many of them there are? Okay, let me put this aside. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in. This is the, one of the boxes I was talking about earlier. It's just a little plastic box from like Taps Plastic. Um, and this makes a nice little observational thing because then you can kind of hang them in there and very gently put them in there and make sure nobody's antennae get stuck. Uh -huh. And then hopefully we can kind of get a little better view. Oh, that's maybe too close on these guys. So this male is gonna show you um, where they're getting their name. Those two orange dots are these kind of, they're, they're called the warty glow spot cockroach. Is there a place I can put in the comments? Oh yeah. Yeah. Put in the comments the species name of these. Okay. It, it seems like there's a lot of reflection too. I know, I know. Maybe we should, um, let me see. I know, I'm still working on getting, no, that's worse. Okay, let's see. Let's try. Ooh, that's great. Oh my gosh, Stephanie, that's, that's amazing. That's lidless. So <laughs> Okay, well, okay. I decide to stay chill. Okay, let me see. Can I I want to add a comment so I can add Well, maybe I can't comment. Can I comment? Uh, you should be able to comment. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, cause I'd love to give you guys the species name of this. Do you see in this, in the bar on the, on the right, um, there should be multiple options. Um, I see like the comments there. I just don't see a window where I can add one. Oh, hmm. Maybe it's, I I've never really used that before with the guest commenting. I, I would think that you can. I know, do you see the private chat one? Oh, here, Marley, how about since you're writing, would you mind writing the species name? Yeah, I, that would be a, that would be an important thing for me to write on here anyways. Okay, so the common name is warty glow spot cockroach, like as in having warts. So W-A-R-T-Y and then glow spot. I always see glow spot as written as one word. Glow spot is one word. That's how I've seen it written in okay, the, well, I started the doing communities. Glow spot cockroach. And these are native to South America. And let me know when you're ready to write out a uh, unfortunately very long genus name. <laughs> That's fine. Um, let me just write South America here real quick because that kind of looks like a turnip, not South America. Okay. Um, all right. I'm ready for the, the name. How long is it so I can space this out? It's long. Um, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> the genus is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 letters long. And then okay. species is like nine letters long. All right. So it's Lucy, Lucy Hormetica. So L U C I A O H O R M Horm E T I C A Etica E T I C A. Okay. And then the genus, and don't don't capitalize your uh, your species name. It's gonna yep. make me twitch. Um, sub -syncta. so S U B sub C I N C T A. Um, I have it as S I N C T A. Okay, cool. So, yeah, these uh, so let me tell you so what you're seeing here the male is the one with the orange in the wild, those actually glow in the dark, they glow. Um, they um, do not glow in captivity. What I've read is that they think that there's a fungus they feed on in oh the gosh. wild mm -hmm. that um, they obtain, right? So in insects, right, there's either that they produce chemicals themselves, and insects are really amazing producers of a lot of really cool chemicals, right? Think about bombardier beetles or um, fireflies, things like that. Um, or they sequester them, right? They take them from the foods they eat. Right. Uh, a great example of that is monarchs, right? The monarch butterfly is not toxic, except for the fact that it's larvae feed on milkweed and they they sequester the toxins from that. Uh -huh. 
Um, so yeah, so the male of these, I've heard that it's a fungus. I don't know for sure if that's true, but that's what I've, I've been told. Um, they will feed on those and then they get that glowing spot. And you can see the female has kind of a similar place, but it's not yeah. not bright orange like that. Right. And, um, these are both adults. So this is their full wing length. So this is an example of an insect that has reduced its wings. In uh, all um, true insects, someday I wanna do a class um, for everybody on like the way the insect body evolved. Cause I think that's really cool for nature journaling. Like why do they have six legs and um, why, you know, all of that. Um, but anyhow, they, um, if, if, an, if you have an adult insect like this that has reduced or, um, or no wings, like the case of an ant, it's a secondary uh -huh. loss. Meaning that all, all things that we recognize currently as insects had wings at some point. Now there's right. a few, like springtails that are technically not insects. They're just another kind of hexapod. Um, that's a no, not an insect, a six legged arthropod that is a kind of basal to the insects. Um, and then the thing that you're seeing sticking out of that female is yeah, an, what the heck is that? It's an egg case. And you can, you can see this. Oh, I thought that was the male. Oh yeah. No, that's the female. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If any of you are blessed enough to have cockroaches in your home, you sometimes see this. <laughs> Um, that they will, they actually will create an egg case and then um, they suck it back into their body and they oh my God. carry it and incubate it. So cockroaches appear to give live birth a lot of the time, but they actually don't. Whoa, um, that's crazy. It's kind of a common mode for cockroaches. They, they will, this is the most common way they'll. So would that be, is that like rounded on the other side there too? Like that egg yeah. case? Yeah, sometimes, you know, if they if they're not doing great, like if you, you know, you're not feeding them enough or they're, you know, they're stressed or something, you'll sometimes they'll they'll extrude these, they'll leave them out and you'll see them in the cage. Um, yeah. Originally. And uh, they yeah, and they, they kind of are rounded on both ends. And um, I'm not sure with these how many babies they in particular have oh, wow. one of these probably around a dozen or so. And the babies start out here. Maybe let me see if I can add a baby in there. There's teeny tiny ones in here. These guys all need a good feeding and a spray down. There's a little baby. Come here, buddy. He's teeny. Here's a teeny baby. Do you see him? Oh, yeah. Let me draw that, too. It would be good to have the... um. Yeah, so that's a little baby. Can and they the camera can... over onto the baby a little bit? Yeah. Do you want me to zoom in? Um, sure. Zoom him a little. Let's see. I've got a. Okay. Oh, he moved. There you are. Uh oh. Here he is. He's hanging out near Papa. And that's of course making a huge assumption about who the father is. <laughs> 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 there are hundreds in here. Um. It looks like it has light marks on the tips yeah, of the antennae yeah, on that one. Yeah, antennae are striped. They have a light section and then another dark section after it. That's kind of interesting because you really wouldn't think that that would um, break up the pattern of it too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder why that is. All right, well, I'm going to do a little bit. I'm not sure if other people are nature journaling along with this. It looks like um, even though lots of people voted for cockroaches, that some people dropped off the yeah. uh, as soon as the cockroaches came on. So congratulations to the hardcore 15 or so people that are still on. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I have on my page so far. Um, so I would put a little bit more metadata in here, you know, like um, – live show with Stephanie or things like that. But I've got, um, you know, my date here and then I have sort of a title and I broke up the title with a little bit of um, bubble letters. And I tried to do a quick map when she mentioned they're from South America. It looks a little bit like a weird turnip, but you know, if you had more time, you could do that a little bit better. But I'm also using two colors to help create sort of a visual hierarchy. And then I have the Latin name. I don't think I needed to put this box around it, but um, a quick sketch that I start to do of um, one of the cockroaches and um, another quick sketch, the zooming in on a couple parts. So having some zooming in and using words to describe things. I had a question about the egg case. Um, so I wrote the question here and then she answered it. So I have a little arrows kind of showing that and then I have the juvenile. So that's basically just to show you, you know, you could nature journal in like a 10, in less than 10 minutes. So 
um, just to give you an idea. Oh, and people are answering that there are people, people are drawing. So let's keep it here with the um, cockroaches maybe a little bit longer. And I, I encourage people, you know, this is a cool opportunity. It's not necessarily your normal nature journaling situation, but Stephanie is providing us um, some of this information that we would maybe, you know, some people like to do homework and look things up um, while they, uh, after they do their pages at home. So now we have, instead we have an expert with us, we have Stephanie. So you could be putting in some of that information um, alongside your drawing. So Stephanie, you could just keep um, talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, one thing I'll mention about the life cycle here is that in insects, right, you have, in, in terrestrial arthropods, you kind of have three basic life cycles. You have one that's called um, ametaboly, where there's no metamorphosis at all. Things like tarantulas do that, right? A baby tarantula looks a lot right. like uh, adult tarantula. They sometimes get different colors. Baby tarantulas tend to be very drab colored, even if the adults are fancy or colored or patterned. Um, and then they eventually do get their like reproductive organs and things like that. And those um, arthropods also continue to shed their exoskeleton as adults. Right. Um, Sex will never do that. The only exception, I just said never, <laughs> but when you have over a million kinds of something, there's always exceptions. There are things like mayflies, they have a sub adult stage called the sub imago, and then they molt after that. But other than that, pretty much insects do not molt as adults. So these will be, these are full grown and they will not grow anymore. Um, hmm. And what these guys have is what's called incomplete metamorphosis or hemimetaboly. And that means that you see that, that nymph, that baby cockroach, it looks like a cockroach. It right. It's not a, a huge dramatic morphological difference from the adult. Like a baby human. Yeah, exactly. Like human babies, they look different than adults. They right, they don't their proportions are different. They they don't have obviously, you know, they're not sexually mature. They don't have features an adult would, right? No none of that, right? And they're they're proportionally their heads are bigger and stuff. But they look like a human, right? You can easily tell. Like I always say to kids in my classes like it's not a big leap to realize that this is a baby of this animal, right? right. It looks similar that, enough. That one's the, 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 the female looks like she's climbing out there, huh? Yeah, she's thinking about it. Um, whereas um, with something like a caterpillar or a maggot or a beetle grub, it took people like Maria Marianne to figure out that this turns into that because it's right. such a dramatic life uh, change for them. Um, so insects that do this are obviously all the cockroaches. Cockroaches actually, they're one of their closest relatives. Um, well, their very closest relative are, um, are termites. Termites and cockroaches used to be in two separate orders of insects and now they're actually together. So we- oh, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, that it, and that's actually a fairly, you know, recent development. That's, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I got taught that they were, this, they were separate orders. Um, by some of my professors. So they, they it's a more recent development. Um, but uh, but yeah, so things like uh, grasshoppers, uh, cicadas, dragonflies, these are the animals that go through this um, incomplete metamorphosis. Um, okay, like, wait, hold on. So there's um, cockroaches are incomplete. Uh, 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 all of the praying mantises, grasshoppers, that group. Um, and you said, um, what was the other Dragon, one? Dragonflies, cicadas, yeah. things like that. You know, I could keep listing. There's a lot. But what's interesting is then when you get into the complete metamorphosis, that's that's one of those markers in insect evolution where we see an absolute explosion in diversity. So um, about 90, is it 85 or 90? 85 or 90 percent, I can get you that number in a second, percent of insects go through complete metamorphosis because we see such a huge explosion. Like Wait, so, so approximately 90% go through complete. Yeah, it's a huge point on the insect tree of life where we just see this explosion in diversity. So is that the ancestral, you know, is that like going back to, is that the the original insect trait is to have complete metamorphosis? No, no. That's the more recently yeah. Okay. yeah, and that's where you have um, the big orders. 
So to give you an idea, like the most species groups of insects that go through incomplete metamorphosis, we're talking about the order of thousands or tens of thousands of species. When you get into complete metamorphosis, um, that's when you're in the hundred or hundreds of thousands of species, right? Things like beetles where we have 400,000 described species. And that's also a very important point in insects is that um, we think that there's at least 5 million species of insects on the planet and we've only named one of one million of them. So wow. there's huge diversity that's unknown. Okay, the- hold on one second. I'm gonna use this as a teaching moment. So what I'm gonna do right now is everything on my page is um, words and images and even a map is kind of a diagram, but um, she just mentioned some numbers. Well, I actually have this 90% of insects, but she mentioned something that would be perfect for um, a, uh, a little pie chart. So, I mean, this is, we'll use the approximate sign um, a lot, but so could you, could you say that again about how, what was that breakdown of the, um, you said something about the percentage or the number of millions known and the number not known. Maybe I can make a little yeah, so uh, the most conservative estimates are that there are 5 million insect species on the planet. There are entomologists who go as high as 30 million, um, but we have 1 million species currently that have been described, meaning that a scientist like myself has, you know, given them a, a formal name. They're, they're kind of, think of it as making a list of life on earth, right? Um, right how do right. you normally do that in, in science? Um, okay. uh, in the so beetles, they go through complete metamorphosis. Yes, Ivea, they they do, yeah. So the big four insect orders are beetles, coleoptera, lepidoptera, um, which are butterflies and moths, um, hymenoptera. My favorite. Ants, bees, wasps, and um, which ones? Oh, and cole- I said coleoptera already. Lepido- oh, diptera. Diptera. Flies. So those are those contain about eighty five percent of all insect life in those four orders, um, and and they all go through complete metamorphosis. So they're not the only ones that go. Through. There's a few you know, not so diverse orders that go through complete metamorphosis. But we do see this huge huge surge um, in diversity. Um, oh, and the cockroach is grooming itself a little bit. You can see the male there. He's kind of cleaning off. Wait, could you say the thing about how many million are known? There's one million known species. One in- million known, and we think the conservative estimate is five million unknown, or five million total. Um, and then the, so you basically only one in five insect species is known. Okay, so I'm going to make, um, this would be a good chance to do something like maybe a little pie chart. And so I'll make the the known part in black and then the unknown in this gray. Uh, and wait, what was it? It was 1 million known. Yeah, and, I, and about, if you're doing that conservative estimate, there'd be 4 million unknown species. Okay, so I'll do four, how would I do four to 30 million? Yeah, million? Right? <laughs> yeah that, that, uh, that mentor of mine, Terry Irwin, that I mentioned earlier, he was famous for a, an estimate that he made that put it at around 20 to 30 million. And actually, I just attended a talk at the Coleopter Society where they were, you know, people later kind of scoffed at it and thought it was a little too crazy. But there's there's evidence that it it's it's closer to the larger numbers than than we think. Like, I mean, yeah. the other thing is, how do you estimate something that's unknown? Exactly. Um, and I I can tell you a little bit about that because like that's right. what I, I did with my paper where we were um, we we were estimating. Um, we were looking at the number of beetles in the particular group. There had been 50 um, species recorded from Ecuador in a group of bark beetles. Yeah. And we found three over 300 um, just in the canopy foggings that we did. Um, so clearly there's a lot of unknown ones. But then we also ran a bunch of these um, analyses where we actually used... Um, different statistics to try to estimate the number of species. This is kind of similar to give you guys a perspective on how this is done by people who are studying biodiversity. Think about like, how do you estimate the population of giraffes? You do something called mark release recapture. So right, you yeah. you get catch giraffes, you tag them, you identify them as individuals, you release them, 
And then you keep doing that, right, as you're kind of monitoring the population. That's how you figure out how many giraffes there are in the population, how often you encounter the same giraffe again and how often you encounter new giraffes. And through this, there are some fancy algorithms that you can run this data through to figure out what your population level is like. Think of that instead of you're doing it with individuals, you're doing it with species. So these algorithms basically use different math tricks to figure out if you're encountering through this much collecting this many new species that have not been encountered and through this many samples you're encountering this many new species again and again that you didn't see in the previous samples it, it gives you this estimate oh and marley's indicating it's time for a chocolate break apparently oh shoot that wasn't supposed to be on camera <laughs> yeah i like how you think oh yeah this just I, i'm not sponsored by this company yet unfortunately but, uh, <laughs> this stuff right here is Really, I usually go for just the straight dark chocolate, but this stuff is crazy yeah. good. Um, I mean, so you December without overloading on chocolate, you need. I know, food. right? Oh, yeah. Um, so you mentioned something really, really interesting. I think um, you mentioned that it's hard to estimate things that are unknown, and so um, in the nature journaling community, we're really interested in questions. And one definition of a question that I um, have heard is, um, you know, that questions are really the, um, the only intellectual tool that we have to deal with the unknown. So what I'm thinking right now, and I know that some people are doing this already, but why don't people who are watching post questions, like if we, as if we were doing, and I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, go ahead in the comments or on your Nature Journal page, write some questions that you have about these, um, these organisms that we're looking at right now. And it doesn't, they don't all need to be answerable questions or they don't necessarily need to be things that Stephanie can answer, but let's just practice <laughs> asking some questions. I see one person already asked, how old are the adults? Go ahead and just post a bunch of questions or write questions, things I, that you're curious about. I know a lot of the cockroaches that I keep in captivity, the adults will live like one to three years, but given how many individuals I have, I have no idea. Okay. I got this as a starter for the colony a few years ago, and it actually took a little while. There were there was a point at which I wasn't so sure this colony was going to take and be self-sustaining, and then it just exploded. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I started a colony. I forget what kind they were, um, but it was for feed. Actually, they were just feeders that oh, I got. Yeah, cockroaches. I think they are. Yeah, and there might have been two different kinds in the um, in the little container, but. Um, I um, I started this like tub and I put a bunch of like substrate in them for for them and was feeding them and they weren't work my tarantulas weren't really into eating them they were they were more um, used to eating crickets yeah. and so I basically just stopped feeding them and they were in my garage which is pretty cold um, and like six months or maybe even like a whole year later I looked in the tub and there were still some in there. Yeah, cockroaches are pretty hardy, yeah. I do have another species of cockroach that I could bring out that's um, an example of how cockroaches cannot be hardy, and that's a species that I have that's actually extinct in the wild. It's very commonly kept by entomologists, but um, the wild populations became extinct. So that's an interesting story there that shows yeah, that let's, cockroaches uh, don't always conform to our stereotypes of what a cockroach is, right? Yeah, that would be great. Let's do, um, let me mention one thing here. So if you haven't done this already, people are posting um, lots of really cool questions. Yeah. Um, we're not going to try to answer all these right now, but this is part of the exercise for um, nature journaling. And what I would recommend, just kind of going back to the overview of what your, your nature journal page could look like for this bug, um, is at some, some point, you know, you could potentially create like a square here and you could just write a bunch of questions and it would even be cool to write down other people's questions yeah. if you want. So if you're nature journaling in a group, um, you could do that. So that's just kind of an overview of um, how I would organize the page. And you can see I've combined, um, you know, some amount of like bubble letters and like here is a comparison between complete metamorphosis, incomplete metamorphosis, um, yeah. you know, and these different diagrams. So just kind of showing you that um, and then um, Stephanie is mentioning um, getting another cockroach. So bonus points to anyone that can name the nature journaling technique. And Jack, 
John Muir Laws mentions this, a specific term or phrase around this a lot. What would be the nature journaling technique that you would use um, with this cockroach um, species here and then having the other one? Like if you were to nature journal those both on the same page, what technique would you use? Um, go ahead and post it in the comments if you know. And um, I, yes, I think they're getting a hang of this modeling. Look how nicely they've arranged them. There, there are very, very <laughs> um, willing models. Could you? Would it be possible to put um, both in the same frame? Both species. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's try that. So one of the things I saw there are some questions about speed. Cockroaches can vary quite a lot in their speed, and this is a slower moving species. These guys tend to be kind of bumbly, like they don't they don't race around. The one that I'm going to get out in a moment, <laughs> they tend to race a little bit. Oh, so really? They're they're a little faster. Yeah. Um. So let's see. Um. Okay. And yeah. And, and then I'll tell you the story because some people are asking about how they went extinct and all of that. Um. This one's called. The, I'm going to bring out. It's called the Simondoa cave cockroach. In fact. Uh, um, Ivea put it up in the in the comments there. You see, she wrote Simondoa question mark. Oh, nice, Ivea. Um, and that is the that is the common name, and it's um, also the generic name, so the genus name. If you want to get started on that, let me here. Let me. Oh, female. I'm gonna put the female back because she seems to be like a little less chill, right? She seems to be trying to get out. So in that, you okay. know. Let yeah, me that good. get the, I'm going to just dump the baby in. Okay. And part of it is how if you don't handle them too much, they don't get too stressed. So. Okay, so the story of the Simondoa cave cockroach is, is actually interesting because um, I was in Ecuador last year um, at one of those bug shop workshops, and I was one of my instructors was the um, one of the scientists who discovered this species. Okay, let's see if we bring one of these out. <laughs> these squeak a little. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Oh, okay. Oh, he is holding still. Oh, wow. That is really pretty. Yeah. So here's their story. It's kind of a happy, sad story. The story is that they were discovered in a cave um, in the Simondoa region in Africa. I think that's West Africa. And um, ugh, they smell like pee. That's another oh, no. thing. Be lucky you can't smell that. <laughs> I accused my children of peeing in the car once when I had these. Oh my cars. God, that is so funny. Oh, hey guys, okay, wait, hold up. There is one that just molted in here too. So if you oh. go back to that, um, when you have a big colony like this, this happens. So these guys were discovered by this um, scientist, uh, Petr Nistrowski is his name. And they uh, documented these in a cave. Now keep in mind that ecologically caves are like islands, especially yeah. for the animals that cannot travel between caves. You may have things like bats that are widely distributed that yes, are going to yeah. be able to travel between different cave systems. But for a lot of organisms that live in caves, especially ones that evolved there, they are pretty tied to that cave. They don't right. easily transport between one cave and another um, unless those caves are somehow connected underground, right? Um, and in fact, even though these have bigger wings than your glow spots, they do not fly. They can glide a little. So if I dropped one, it would open those wings and kind of gently glide to the ground a little more. Um, but so he discovered these. They live in this cave and they uh, fed on bat guano, which is a common thing for... Um, cave cockroaches to feed on, bat guanos, bat droppings, right? Um, and uh, so anyhow, they, he brought some back with him. He's actually located in Africa, so he doesn't have to worry about permits and stuff to bring things home. Um, and so he brought some back with him and um, they did really well in the laboratory in a cage, just like mine here, which is also similar to that cage you saw earlier. If you open it up, it's kind of like, roiling with cockroach bodies yeah and he shared them with other entomologists who you know there's a whole group of people i've even heard the term used on the internet heirloom cockroaches oh my god <laughs> that with is really love keeping different cockroaches um so uh people were keeping these and then um it's interesting this part of the story um i i recently updated when reading more about it um there was a, a company that was mining for bauxite. 
uh, uh, the, in metal uh, for metal, like uh, what what do they call it when you combine metals? Amalgamate uh, something like. Uh, that. Uh, I'm blanking on uh, right now. You know, metal or comp anyhow, bauxite. They were mining for bauxite. Alloy. Yeah, alloy. I used to always tell people that um, that it, there was a mining accident. I recently was reading another article that actually said that it was not an accident, that they basically knew they were destroying the cave. Like it wasn't like the cave collapsed. It was like they they knew that it was a just it was destructive mining. Uh -huh. So um, the cave is destroyed. It no longer exists. And nobody has seen these guys since in the wild. Wow. So, uh, you know, and this is great for teaching, right? Because then kids, um, kids, you know, ask questions. Well, you have these beetle lady. Why can't you just take them and put them in another cave? Then they'll be happy. Right. With you, right? And then we learn about um, the, the problems there and how these caves are unique ecosystems which contain their own sets of organisms and each cave probably has their own set of things that are going to be feeding on the bat guano or the um you know their own species of cockroaches some of you might any of you notice the little white thing that crawled across his black no no i missed there? that he had a little um i think it's a mite oh wow they often have cockroaches often have these um okay the little guy that was molting finished molting so why don't i throw him in there with them this okay. is one of the um oh my god that's one of the simondoa roaches that just took its exoskeleton off like, oh my while goodness. we were talking and you can see he's white sometimes maybe again if you are fortunate oh there's oh no nope that's a reflection i thought i saw the little white guy again that was crawling on him um oh no now you can see it see it right there on the Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little mite. You often have mites and things like that on cockroaches. Um, so this guy just molted his exoskeleton and that's why he's white. Uh -huh. um, wow. I'll keep, I'll keep babbling. Um, <laughs> essentially an insect exoskeleton, think of it kind of like when we form plastic, right? Um, a plastic is formed when these chemical bonds create the, the material, right? And you know, other than plastics that melt in the sun, you really don't change that material again, right? It's uh, really hard to break those bonds again. And that's part of why we as people like plastics, right? Because we can make these durable things with them. So once an exoskeleton hardens, it doesn't, those bonds are formed and they don't break easily. Um, so that's why insects um, and other arthropods have to just take off their whole skeleton and grow a new one. What you're seeing here now is a white cockroach and that's because it has a soft exoskeleton that basically has the constituents of an exoskeleton, but the bonds haven't completely solidified yet. And so um, often pigment hasn't come in at that point. Um, and so he's gonna darken over the next few um, hours. Within the few hours, he'll be like a light tan and within a few oh. days, he'll be pretty dark. That's really cool. That'd be a really cool thing to show, so to show, right. show stages of. Get out your paints and like mix paints. Yeah, and just have, you know, like the um, change over time is what yeah. Jack calls it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the legs are still red on the Simondoa one too, right? Yeah, they're kind of a reddish, yeah. Um, and one thing uh, I'll point out too is when you guys are looking at these, and, and those of you who took my class at Wild Wonder may remember this when I talked about drawing beetles. So I'll use this pen to point. So in cockroaches, one of the characteristics is they have this kind of concealed head. And if you think about a praying mantis, their head is actually kind of bowed this way too. They kind of, yeah. they, but they hold their bodies upright. So it looks a little different, but that's one of those features that um, shows these two together. Um, but yeah, so their heads are kind of concealed. This guy you see just a little peeking out right around there. That's the head. And then this thing that you're seeing here that I know is really tempting to call the thorax um, is just the first segment of the thorax. It's called the pronotum. Uh, P-R-O-N-O-T-U-M, pronotum. And um, so on things like cockroaches and beetles, they have um, all insects, and again, this is, I really wanna do this class with you guys sometime about how insect bodies evolved. The, the thorax was um, formed by three ancestral segments. And so there's three parts of the thorax. 
this is the pronotum is the is the first it's it's the this visible part of the first segment so that part evolved from the thorax it is it's part of the thorax it's still considered part of it yeah it's um you would you know more generally you'd call this region the prothorax and the yeah. pronotum is actually technically just this plate on the top of it um but the whole region and each region of the thorax has a pair of legs that's associated with it so as you can see right this guy his legs are connected all the way down here if we flip these guys over you could really see that he's got one that's connected down here so technically the abdomen is just everything beyond those legs oh and there's another little mite running around on him Cockroaches really often have these mites in captivity and they're um, they're actually, as long as your cockroach colony isn't terribly unhealthy, the mites are actually pretty beneficial, both for the cockroaches and especially for us. There's actually evidence really? that zookeepers, um, some zookeepers will develop allergies to cockroaches if they end up working with them too much. It's usually the proteins of the shed exoskeletons. Wow. Um, mites, you know, they're detritivores and they'll clean that up and so, um, if your cockroach colonies have some mites, they're actually a little cleaner. Um, cool. I'm going to mention a couple, uh, just to throw in a couple nature journaling concepts right now is um, this would be a perfect opportunity to do the joint comparison, you know, and um, Jack talks about this a lot, but when you're looking at two things um, at the same time, uh, you can see and notice a lot more than if you're just looking at one thing. And so it's just like the way the human brain works. Like if you're considering between two colleges to apply for or whatever, if you're just looking at one, um, you won't notice as many things about it. So having two things to look at, in this case, these cockroaches, um, just by the way our brain works, will help you observe more about it. So there's a lot of ways and you can look up in Jack's book and in some of Jack's classes, how he does that and structures that. But that's always a good thing you can do with bugs. And then another thing that you could do, and um, Stephanie at the beginning of the show showed a page of this, is you can do what's called a collection. So you could decide, I'm going to do cockroaches or I'm going to do beetles. And so Stephanie had a page with three different um, examples of beetles. And you could just go through the day or you could say like bugs on leaves. And you could just spend the day in your garden going and finding different bugs that seem to be feeding on leaves and create that as like a collection. And there's a couple nature journalers who are really great at doing this in a simplified way. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you on my page right now, but there's a way that you can um, avoid getting into the details. Um, and you could just be like hiking around or in your garden. And, um, oh, I have a page, hold on, I have a page to show this. And you can do just very simplified drawings. So you can make a collection um, where you don't have to get too in depth into the um, the illustrations if that's intimidating and just kind of um, make these um, simple drawings uh, and I have an example here somewhere um, from the Grand Canyon trip but there's a, I think a nature journaler who's in Australia who does a really good example of this um, let's see here um, where is it? And what I did is my collection was just um, pollinators and bugs that I found on flowers. And I did these just quick sketches of them. And it's a really empowering way to nature journal bugs or anything. So here's an example. And I was getting oh, this. Yeah. I think it might be Paula Peters. Um, I'm not sure. But that does this with birds and other bugs. But I mean, you can see some of them are like all they are is um, like, you know, a little bit of words, tiny black bee. Um, you know, this was a hemiptera, I think, um, that looked predatory. And all I could get was this quick sketch of it, a little red beetle. So, you know, you don't have to have really great drawings because a lot of times arthropods are very complex um, and you might start worrying about your ability to draw it well. But if you do a collection like this, and this was just, um, as you can see here, I write all seen on one baccarus in 25 minutes. So this is a, um, a type of plant. I spent 25 minutes there and just tried to do this collection. So those are just a couple joint comparison, collection. Um, and then the other one, I would call this right here, just to apply nature journaling vocabulary. This one, that this page I did with the warty glow spot cockroach, this is what I would call a species profile. 
So you might notice that most people's nature journal pages fall into this category. They'll find a flower, they'll draw it from a couple different angles, they'll write the name, a little bit of information from it. And, and species profile is a really good thing, um, but don't let this be your own, the only tool in your uh, nature journaling vocabulary. So, you know, try a, a joint comparison, try a collection, some of these other things to, to mix it up a little bit. I'm gonna move these guys off for a second because I wanna show a couple things I thought of to show okay, you. Okay, great. Remember these page that I, I showed, right? That you were just mentioning. Do you see yeah. how I did this? This is the actual size of this beetle. So I yep. did that with a bunch of these where I put the actual size as just a quick little, you know, it could have been the outline of the beetle like you just did in your page. So that's another good tool to show, right? So you actually get a scope, right? Because this is not a beetle that's the size of my finger. I was not in the tropics, <laughs> you know. It's, Absolutely, it's that yeah, it's super important. Um, and then if you guys, um, entomologists, so what we do, here's a page that I here, I'm gonna show you on my general cam to first so you can just get an idea of the general page of oh, their little turtle page too um oh that's the turtle page this is a page i did that was a, a pin specimen that my son and i had collected in arizona and um in entomology you often see these little labels that are attached to the bug right here, you, you mentioned your metadata let's go back so i can show you and maybe i can even write one of these out in in per right now too to show you guys how this is done so this is literally just transcribing the label data on it, my insect um and this is how i teach my students and how i was taught and how all entomologists do this we have a basic format for which we record this data because insect specimens are data they're time capsules insect collections are a really important source of you know this is part of how we tell things like what the habitat of the of these animals are or their range or how their diversity decline or changes in them you know over time and now we're even getting to sequence dna out of these specimens so having this data is incredibly important um so this is the format that all entomologists use and in fact let me grab a blank page on the journal and and we'll do one of these together really quick and i'll show cool. you yeah that's great um, so if like, let's say we were doing one for where I am today, which is in San Mateo, okay, uh, California. So you go with the coarsest level first, it would be USA. Okay, some other countries have other abbreviations. Sometimes you just, you know, do that. Usually do a comma though, you know, you can, since this is done in this format, you often can then just leave that the commas off. So then California would be my next um, coarsest um, measure, right? And then I'd go to my county, right? And I'm in San Mateo County. Um, when I do these labels, I do them on a, just usually in a regular word processor program where I have it done to a really small font and formatted a certain way. And then we tend to like to print them on laser printers because um, your inkjet is not um, as archival, right? And then you, these, if you do them on lab, your actual labels, right? Um, but this is talking about it in terms of doing it in your um, in your nature journal. Yeah. Um, then it would be the county if we're talking in the United States. In other areas, right? It would be the province. Um, you know, depending on what kind of uh, what country you're in. So, so San Mateo is your county, also. Yeah. So it's a little confusing then, because then for me it's San Mateo. Huh. Um, the labels that I often make for when my son and I are collecting in, in the yard, then I often do, um, I'm in what's called the North Shoreview neighborhood. Um, so I would maybe put that. Um, and you can, you know, you can go on to um, the other, um, other line. Um, and you know, it's kind of all up to you, especially if you're recording this as metadata in your journal, you can take up tons of space when we get into like putting this in an insect collection. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got a cockroach to wrangle. Hold on. Get back in there. <laughs> They're seeing the opportunity to escape. <laughs> Come back. It's like, she's not paying attention. Let's, let's make a break for it. Okay. Um, oops. I got your antenna in there. At, at UC Davis, they have a really cool exhibit showing um, the printing press um, little pieces oh, that they used to yeah, use for yeah. uh, printing the labels. Yeah, so for me, like, let's say I found a bug on um, on my salvia plant, on my, you know, so I could do, you could just say salvia or on 
salvia species. And then, um, so it's often some ecological or biological data can go on yeah. there. Back in the day, we used to sometimes always carry around the, a, a GPS. Remember when you used to have a separate GPS thing that you spent hundreds of dollars on? <laughs> um, we used to have those, those were really great. And then we put like the actual GPS coordinates. And then here's a, here's a big thing. The way that entomologists write the date is a little different. And that's because there's so many different ways that people write dates, right? All right. Over. We always do the day. So like today would be the 20th um, in a, the uh, in regular, uh, blah, 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 what am I forgetting? Um, in Arabic numerals. And then we go to Roman numerals for the month. So, oh. so this is how an entomologist would write today's date. Wow. On our, on our labels. Cause then there's no confusion, right? right. Yeah. If, um, if you had like, let's say we were the second of the month, and I wrote mm -hmm. 2.12.2020. Mm -hmm. Am I talking about the 12th of February or am I talking about the 2nd of, of uh, December? Does that make yeah. sense? Um, and then you've probably saw in there, you, we often put our names. Um, so I, you know, because that actually does matter in terms of, you know, being able to, to discuss with the person. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, my name or, you know, and when I showed you, it had my son's name. And this is great. You know, it's great important data that you have now collected on this animal. So, like that right. that moth I showed you. Do, 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 do. Where is my moth? Is she in a different journal? Oh. What about? Oh yeah. No, okay. Never mind. Um. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So that that'll show you how that's done. Let's. I'll bring the cockroaches back. Since. And yeah, Jack says you know that if you have a drawing, um, and you have a date and a location next to the drawing. He said, if you have a drawing of an animal, it's a drawing. If you have a drawing of an animal with a date and a location, that's data. Yeah, yeah. And often we'll put um, weather conditions sometimes. For me, like I studied bark beetles, which often had host specificity. So host plants were definitely important. And for my dissertation, oh my gosh, I was so happy when people actually had host plant data because that was something I was trying to assemble in my um in my uh, my paper that was basically you know overviewing and revising the genus of beetles that I worked yeah. on, so it was great to have because with bark beetles that's really important. Um, so yeah, like adding all that information, it's and it's it's a great little time capsule too. Like I have I have specimens I collected and my maiden name is on there. I show mm -hmm. them to you know my high school students and they're like. Yeah whoa, you collected that in 1998. That was so long ago, <laughs> you know, right? Um, yeah, that's really cool. Here, let me um, I'm thinking now would be a good time to, um, you know, I've had you on here forever and I feel like we could keep going, but I want to see if people have any um, things that they ran into while they were nature journaling bugs um, in this, you know, with these cockroaches that they, they want to discuss or have any questions about yeah. or any issues. Um, go ahead and post if you're, if you're on here and you've been nature journaling these cockroaches and you have any questions, um, or any issues that you came up with, go ahead and post something and we'll see if we can. I did see that back. earlier, but I didn't answer that was about cockroaches being pests in people's houses. So yeah. about 3000 kinds of cockroaches that we've described again, keep that mm -hmm. in mind, right? There's some others that are undescribed yeah. and, um, and only about 10 are at all pests. And a bunch of those are just what we call paradomestic pests, which means that they'll maybe live near humans, but not actually in our homes. Right. Um, but really like there's only a handful like the German and the American cockroach that are pest species. Um, and those have the, that profile, right? That we're used to of being super hardy, indestructible, all of that stuff, right? But then we saw like with these Simondoa cockroaches that they, have fragile ecosystems. They live, you know, they are subject to extinction. And we have right here, like when I go hiking on the peninsula up in the, you know, we've got the Peninsula Open Space Trust and I'll go hiking and I see native wild cockroach species. You would never find those in people's homes. They just, right. they are a native, um, you know, and these animals, their main ecological role is, is actually as cleaners of the environment. They are decomposers and they're, you know, yeah. Eating, eating up all the detritus and all the waste in the forest and turning, recycling that material. So, you know, right. it's really easy to like, I often say to little kids, like if you lived in a town of 3000 people and about like five people were like lousy people and, you know, mean, would it be fair for me to say that, oh, everybody in that town is mean, yeah. right? Like, 
there are some pests in cockroaches, but mm. that's such it's a small fair. Yeah. 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 Um, I see Kit done some, I don't see any specific um, questions or issues people ran into with their nature journal pages, but Kit is yeah, yeah. wondering um, what can the um, cockroaches sense with their antennae? Yeah, so antennae are fascinating. Um, to step back for a second, the reason that antennae are so important, um, the, the way that insects and other arthropods are different from us, is we take for granted that our skin has nerves running through it, and we are constantly collecting information about the world through our skin. You know, whether your clothes are soft or, or rough, or the temperature or the moisture of the air, and little subtle things like that. They don't have nerves running through their exoskeletons. So that's why you see things like that rain beetle we saw earlier that has all the fuzz. A lot of those yeah. can often be attached to nerves under the exoskeleton. Um, so their antennae are super important because it's, you know, imagine that you're kind of covered in a suit, but then you have these things that reach out into the world that give you that information. So they touch with them. They have chemoreceptors, which is essentially taste slash smell. So they can touch things and kind of taste them. They can pick up scents in the air again, like that, um, the rain beetle did. They also have thermoreceptors, so they figure out um, temperature of the environment using their antennae. And they also um, have, uh, what else am I thinking? Uh, well, of course, tactile receptors, thermoreceptors, oh, hydroreceptors, so they can mm. sense moisture too. So that's how they can tell. Um, oh, and the genus and species, we had the Simondoa cave cockroach was Simondoa, let me see if I'll hold this up. Can you read that? Simondoa since Consifarium. Consifarium. Yeah. Simondoa Consifarium. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and, you know, in general, we were just talking about questions, right? Like, yeah. the things I often have to be comfortable with as an entomologist is saying, I don't know. That's because good. there's so much information and yeah. often end up becoming specialists on particular areas, right? Yeah. Uh, and then there's just a lot of like, I don't know, it's not as easy when you have so many animals for somebody, you know, to, um, you know, I remember once I was in a, in a bathroom at a campsite and somebody, you know, who knew I was an entomologist because there were birders and entomologists at the same field site uh -huh. and uh, Sage Hen Creek, one of the UC field sites up in the Sierra. And um, somebody asked me, like, they said, I saw a bug today. It was green and it had, you know, six legs and it had wings and this and that, right? And they're like, what was it? And I was like, mm, it could have been this, it could have been, yeah. been that. I left the restroom and I could hear her through the window say to her friend, I thought she said she was an entomologist. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, like, it's there's a lot. Uh, and that's what's fascinating. And what's fun for me is I'm always learning new things. Like I'll, I'll, you know, read something or be hanging out with an entomologist who's an expert on another group and they'll tell me something and I'll go, ah, oh my God, that's so cool. I didn't know that. So yeah. it's fun to have all that. Cool. Um, so one, uh, I'm going to just go over a couple of things here that um, I have left to do or suggestions about like page layout. Um, but um, you know, one thing people can do is you can always go back and like with your, you know, you can add some color to some of these things. So it, it when you're having this moment um, with Stephanie right here, um, you don't have that much time. So it's good to do things kind of quickly. And then in this, in this case, um, there is a video record of this. So you could go back and yeah. see exactly what the glow spot looks like. So for example, here I've got, I'm going to do my joint comparison here, but right now I just got um, the, the Sinandoa one and I'm over here I'm gonna put the glow spot so I'll have my comparison and go back and add some color and stuff like that um but just to kind of um, review maybe um, you know like what would you say if you could give like five tips for nature journaling bugs like what oh, would you yeah. Well, and let me comment that I think it's really great to see those pages like yours because you know you often so often in this group, you see such talent, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't realize like, that's not what their page looks like when they just right. left the field, right? It's good Absolutely. to see unfinished pages. I like that because it's a yeah. great page already, but you're not done with it and you're not gonna right. you know, necessarily post it just yet. Yeah. Um, so tips, somebody commented that this was such a valuable tip for them. Insects are bilaterally symmetrical, right? Mm. So if you have a limited amount of time, in fact, 
I start all of my beetle drawings. This is my like bare bones kit that I take with me. I start all my beetle drawings with the straight line and pencil down the center of the page or where oh. I put the bug. Cause then I know, right. It gives me a center point that helps me kind of make things symmetrical. Yeah. Um, also, if you're in the field or you're at a info collection or you're, you know, rushed, do one half of it. There's by unless we're talking about those ganadromorphs that we mentioned earlier. <laughs> you're, you're bilaterally symmetrical. Right. So there's going to be the same thing on either side. That being said, if you want it to look more natural, and I talk about this a lot in my Wild Wonder class, um, a dead pinned insect is going to look different than an insect in the wild, right? Like entomologists yes. often arrange the legs right. a certain way, will spread the wings. They're too the spread. Body. And yeah, sometimes it depends on the person who does it too, right? Because I, I mean, I've seen that before when I've gone to the um, the the museum at Davis to draw yeah, the butterfly. Part, yeah, yeah, and butterflies. Anybody who who spreads a butterfly is going to spread it in a way that the butterfly will actually never hold its wings naturally. So you right. can totally tell in a heartbeat if you see a, a a beautiful drawing of a butterfly sitting on a flower when the right. person drew a dead butterfly. Yeah. <laughs> You know, most people wouldn't notice, but some people might, right. you know, often notice things. And even if we can't explain it, like our, our complex human brains go, oh, there's something not right about that. That's um, the yeah. same with the fish. Um, the the fish illustrator and biologist oh, yeah. I talked to last week, he talked about how it's important for identification to show the, the fins all opened up. But usually oh. in nature, they don't have all their fins spread out that much all at once, or, you know, it, it depends on how they're moving. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Right. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, and that's the same reason for butterflies is that we're basically putting them in a position for their identification. Insects. So if you draw insects, uh, you know, and that's where photographs can be really good, too, is if you take have photographs of insects that are on leaves, on plants, climbing on rocks, flying, doing living insect things, they're going to look a little different in their positioning. Um, yeah, totally. As challenging as it can be um you know that's a good place to start too um and yeah and i would say don't be shy about photo references i have like a whole pinterest board that's like insect art inspiration so cool. and i just yeah. go through that time to time whether it's going to be for my nature journaling or i just took a class through my local community college i learned how to use illustrator and i'm now working on some like bug fabric designs yeah. like that. so it's always fun to have like that kind of like oh these are cool even if you don't yeah. You know, like the more we surround ourselves with these things, the more they're part of our artistic vocabulary, right? And yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, so do you have just like a couple tips, you know, like for people getting started nature journaling bugs, like if you could just, you know, the Cliff Notes version yeah. of how to okay. nature journal bugs. So they're symmetrical. So often drawing a straight okay. line down the middle helps. Um, Pay attention to where the legs are attached. Okay, Jack goes cool. over this in really great detail, both in his book um, and in his uh, talks, his YouTube talks about bugs, but their legs are not going to be all, you know, again, this is something that we'll notice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, color is really fun with bugs. I have, I, I just, there's, there's such a great combination of colors. So mm -hmm. I really like colored pencil some of the times in the field just because I often get impatient and I smudge watercolor. I love watercolor at home too. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, color can be such a fun thing with insects. And Jack also in both book also has a lot of great tips for reflectivity yeah. because a lot of things are shiny, reflective. Sometimes they're metallic and that can get a little tricky. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I would say just use lots of different resources. Um, you know, photographs come to my virtual bug drawing days, get some fun field guides and just don't don't be afraid to like copy and practice doodling. Yeah. I, I will often do quick doodles too. One of my little challenges to myself is I will take a brush pen that I carry with me and mm -hmm. this is literally like, okay, draw a bug in like less than a minute. You yeah. know, super messy, but really, really fun, really fast. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so because that for me is a challenge as somebody who has the expertise is to not get bogged down in the details. Yeah, that's so cool. So I think that's good too. And the motion, right? Like I haven't mastered this, but I've seen some amazing nature journal pages that really capture the motion yeah, of the fluttering butterfly awesome. or a zipping dragonfly. And and often like making your tool itself less fine, right? Like mm. that particular pen is one of these um, these Pentel 
brush pens and it literally is like a you could separate that like yeah. a brush and it has cartridges that you can get i love that because i can't do detail in this it's mm -hmm. gonna be messy mm -hmm. um so that's you know sometimes doing um that changing of the time like are you doing a five minute sketch are you doing you know some of the really detailed drawings i've shown you guys those were hours those were days you know yeah there were many layers and that's very different from nature journaling um mm -hmm. And Got so it. fit it to to your time frame too, you know? Yeah. That, and that's fun, right? Limits, constraints can be freeing as an artist and as a creator. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's a great quote about that that I can never remember. Cool, well, those are really good tips. And I think, um, you know, Eve is asking right now about the when's the next virtual bug drawing day. So now would be a good time, you know, like where can people find out more about what you're doing? Yeah. I know you offer classes and stuff like that. Yeah, so all my classes have gone virtual right now. I yeah. hopefully get back to it maybe in 2021. I'm hoping that we'll uh -huh. somehow be able to do some in-person stuff again. Um, so, but I offer classes for all ages. I used to do baby story time at the library. In fact, I just did some toddler story times and I've done a lot of adult classes as well. Uh -huh. Um, so if you're interested in drawing bugs, if you're interested in particular, I've done things for docent groups where they wanted to learn about the nature in their area. Um, I was actually just scheduled right when the pandemic hit, I was going to do a whole series on planting for pollinators locally. Oh. So if you have questions like that, um, you can get a group together. My rate um, right now for virtual programs is $50 per half hour, and you can do any increment of that. I could be on like I am with you today for this yeah. long amount of time, although this one we're doing because we're buddies and we're promoting nature journaling yeah. right um but uh you know the the um uh so yeah uh, and i very much tailor it to whatever you want to, um what your mm -hmm. questions are so if you know you felt like getting a group of friends together to privately sketch bugs we could do that and then the the nature virtual bug drawing day if you search those terms on facebook you have to request to join and i will add you and we do the first sunday of the month um, we do a, an, I basically similar to what you guys saw today. Uh, we bring out a model. I tell about it a little, give you some background, and mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and hopefully someday maybe we'll do in person ones. But one of the silver linings is I've literally had people joining me from Australia and South That's Africa so for that, cool. and you know that definitely wasn't happening when it was at my house in San Mateo. Yeah, and your, your website is just beetlelady.com. Beetlelady.com. Right? Bless my husband's heart. He got me that domain name like. Uh -huh. 16 years ago, <laughs> but beetlelady.com. You can contact me or if you just email Stephanie at beetlelady.com, you can, um, cool. uh, yeah. We you can do stuff with like homeschool groups. Like, you know, like there's a lot of homeschool education pods, people doing, you know, things like that. It seems like, you know, a lot of kids have trouble focusing on Zoom distance education, but it seems like, you know, you have so much charisma and um, so much knowledge and passion and you have all of these like bugs mm -hmm. and specimens it seems like that would be a really engaging thing yeah, over, yeah. over Zoom. and i do and i do series as well so like if you look uh -huh. on my website at detail some of the different classes that i have and i have um in person before the pandemic i would do a lot of things like 16 week series for a homeschool group where we mm -hmm. meet in person every week and i can do that virtually as as well for you guys too and and hopefully when we're back together one of the things i was going to debut this year was going to be a mobile museum where those sorts of displays like you saw with the the colorful insects. I was going to have a ability for a school or a library to set up a virtual insect uh, museum or not virtual, sorry, scratch the virtual, an in-person like a, a museum, uh, you know, pop-up museum yeah. to say, yeah, um, at their location. So hopefully maybe when we're kind of starting to go back to things, that might be a good fit for some so some people who aren't, you know, don't have the budget or don't want to venture off campus yet, but want to bring something to their to their school. Yeah, definitely. Ready. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these um, sort of ending comments here. Suzanne's, uh, you know, having sessions like this is really helping her during this time. That's really awesome, Suzanne. So glad for that. And then yeah, um, Sandy's you. tuning in from Australia. Thanks, Sandy, for joining. That's really cool. Um, Kit. Yeah, just thankful for this. So um, thank you everybody for joining in. And Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy. You have a family, you have a business, you have all of these uh, mouths to feed, uh, including all these bugs. So uh, thank you so much. Um, this was really fun. And um, I look forward to more cool bug education and science education from you in the future.
Yeah, thank you everybody for taking the time to stop and notice bugs today during this during your time watching this because that's that's a gift to me. I, I just want more people to 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 love the thing that brings me so much joy and fills my heart every day of my life. So Yay, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank All you. All right, we'll sign off with that. Happy nature journaling. All right, bye everyone.